Welcome, welcome everyone to the After Hours Gaming League Fall 2018 Grand Finals. Comes down to this. My name is Haloran, and it's my pleasure to be joined by. Great, you ready? You ready? I'm ready. Dude, the I'm box of box, the, the kids and ambiers, the community coach, neighborhood friend in Kalamaka. Good sir, how are you today? Dude, I'm doing really well. You know, despite all the stuff that's been going on in the scene, I'm I'm excited to cast some games, especially alongside you. Man, it's always such a pleasure. I'm really, really excited. And this is it's a really cool tournament that's going on. You know, it's got a pretty hefty prize pool. Um, and obviously the the charity event in itself is is fantastic. So I'm I'm just excited to cast some Heroes of the Storm. It's been too long, man. It's been too long. Big thanks to uh, H -G -A, a H G L for reaching out to us to uh to get us a part of this. For for those who may not be aware, the After Hours Gaming League is uh, something of a twist on corporate sports, like a corporate sports league. You know, like some corporate teams will have a softball league or something like that. Uh, the these savvy characters take their their fights to games things like heroes of the storm uh pug g they're they're doing rocket league i think they're just finishing that up uh, i was watching that a little earlier um there were over 200 teams uh from various different companies um participating in the season uh for fall and they're going to be donating twenty three thousand dollars to charity each team is is looking to donate to a charity of their choice uh really cool stuff the the finals i'll pull up the bracket info Hold speaking up. of that though man it is actually so cool yeah you're talking about how so many or maybe not so many but there's a bunch of companies out there corporations that have like baseball leagues or soccer leagues and stuff like that and it gets me so excited when i think about major corporations stepping into the esports space and having tournaments like this i think it's absolutely fantastic when i was working um at AEM, a company that I worked for before going into streaming full time, mm. I, I was trying to convince those guys to do something similar or like start with some of the local businesses within my city to do something kind of like this. So when I when I see this going on, it gets me really stoked. They're leading the way, man. They're leading yeah. the way. Uh, I have the the bracket image up now. It comes down to Boeing taking on Cerner. Now we we got some information about some of these about these teams, <laughs> and uh, suffice to say, these guys are are some characters. Uh, speaking of Boeing flying one colors, they they gave us an image that I feel really really speaks to who we're dealing with here. <laughs> I just put the the picture up. Uh, guys the drinking jet fuel. Drinking yeah, jet fuel. That that nice. caught me immediately when i saw that picture dude it's actually so funny <laughs> very cool group here it's going to be twist x my airy uh archie and this is me um they are playing to donate to child's play mm -hmm. um a, a charity that we're all very familiar with yep um on the other side it's going to be cerner's cs go team their charity of choice is going to be the first hand foundation now I'm just gonna pull up. They they gave us a document with with some of their pictures and stuff. I'm just gonna try to show my monitor and show you guys. <laughs> I'm gonna look at it up at the exact same time. I gotta. Curious characters themselves. We've got Corey here. He's been playing Movas for a while. Tulio, dude, it's the gym. I see you out here, Tulio. Okay, hey Lee, <laughs> support. Uh, C Crovax, the support player. Hello, Sin. Born in Ukraine. Okay, welcome. And last but not least, I'm I'm just gonna you know, <laughs> Maya. <laughs> Blake, you're 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 out here doing it for the Packers. Apparently, like that that is a picture. N nice hat, nice hat, by the way. It's brilliant. <laughs> I like that they just they went in on these photos. You know, they're they're so fantastic. And oh, yeah. they're fun with it. So. And, that's and that's what that, that's what this is all about having yep. fun um this is going to be a best of five we are all already in the lobby i just wanted to take a moment to to showcase some of the character behind some of the names that you'll see moving around on the screen because that it looks like they have a lot of fun i'm gonna let them know that we we're ready here to start um once we get underway we'll switch over to the draft screen i do believe i have the names correct Boeing on the left, so, Cerner on the right, because I'm good at this, Kyle, and I know what I'm doing. You really do, and you really <laughs> are. Um, 
Have you got to cast much um, Orphea or Malganus? Mm-mm. So I'm excited. There we go. That's that's basically going to be the big question mark for me. Honestly, I have no idea how any of these teams draft or what style of compositions <laughs> they're going to run. But no matter what, we're going to pick it apart and we're going to we're going to find some hard hitting analysis for these teams. That's for darn sure. But I, I that, that's always my favorite part about jumping into a tournament or jumping into brand new teams. It's just seeing where they're at. You know what what they like to run, how they like playing the maps, what maps they like to pick, which ones they like to ban. That's always. It's always my favorite to see uh, how these teams get started. Here we go, baby. This is game number one on BOE. Let's get to it. Baby. I like it. Yeah, I mean, it, there's all, the first round of a best of five is always that shot across the bow, especially if you haven't had too much experience playing your opponent. But after that first game, if there's a standout thing like an Orphea that's dumpster in your back line or something like that, you, you definitely want to start banning against your opponent. Apparently, Orphea is not going to be too much a topic of conversation to go around banned in the first first round there we go kerrigan on boe interesting maybe that's kind of like a pocket pick for mm. boeing cerner just removing that one from the equation orphea on the other side as well as you mentioned so far none of like the major boe style heroes being removed in the ban phase but maybe it's maybe this style of tournament is just literally taking away those comfort picks over and over and johanna another one of those heroes that isn't something that shows up as like an overwhelming power pick on BOE, so it's got to be comfort. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to see uh, these teams clash on their way to the grand final, so I'm not sure if something like a Johanna is a comfort pick that's being taken away. Um, that is a character that brings a lot to the table in terms of wave clear, but this is a two lane battleground. Maybe that is just kind of like one of the cornerstones of success for Boeing. It's like, well, let's see how deep the hero pool is. But when you ban the garage and you, and you see the writing on the wall, you do potentially open yourself up to looking at a first pick Diablo. Which is a fantastic first pick indeed. Jaina and White Mane, oh. the follow-ups here from Boeing. And talking about that Diablo, for those who are tuning in and aren't too familiar with Heroes of the Storm, Diablo is one of those tanks that is just, he's a frontline hero a tank as i just said who's just so powerful his abilities are point and click so so there's not a whole lot of um like skill shots involved with his kit and he's just so good on this map because of the angles of approach for his hero and he can be devastating if put in the right hands my evan malfurion as well fantastic pickups here for cerner honestly this opener for cerner is terrifying yeah, I mean, both teams, I feel like they're getting what they're looking for in the grand scheme of things. The white main pick, I think, is a nice counter to the Diablo engagement with the Maya to back things up. White main is one of those supports that's just like, well, my assassin would have died if I was playing any other support besides white main. So that means the Diablo engagement is going to have to be that much more crisp. Uh, the Medivh ban, followed up by the Cassie. I do think that these are some targeted selections here rather than being necessarily meta conscious decisions in terms of bands i wanted to see medivh in this like why are you banning <laughs> over i think that would be really fun to see in this style of tournament but uh it, okay here we go here, here's some picks that are relevant on the map you got the artanis the amateur opponent level one super strong at burning down the objective and then the anubarak okay i'm I'm seeing things come together here for the draft of Boeing. They've got uh, a lot of burst damage and some lockdown. You can maybe use that cocoon on a Malfurion to try to burst one of the targets on Cerner. But at the same time, Cerner's draft is just so good on the map. Leaming for that poke, Maev for the big uh, team fights, Diablo as well. Malfurion is one of the best supports in the meta right now. And then Sonya, just not usually someone who I would say is just overwhelmingly powerful on BOE, but in the right hand, Sonya is just such a strong duelist. Yeah, Sonya is kind of one of those jack-of-all-trades sort of solo laners, in my opinion. She's a character that can stand up to an Artanis at almost every stage of the game. Um, if they just walk up and start slamming W on Artanis nonstop, shields or not, that's going to be cause for concern. The also brings a ton of sustain, on. backed up by the Malfurion. The Lunara picked the round things out. Kyle, I feel like both of these teams came away with some really solid drafts that are playing not only to teamfight capability, but just the raw ability to race. I really want to see how much value Sin's going to be able to bring to the table with the Li Ming as far as poking and enforcing a response out of Boeing. Because um, Li Ming can just hang back, throw those orbs all day on Immortals and, and force an Anubarak to potentially burrow in. That could be a bad time. The Anubarak is going to be very important very very true so far definitely boeing has the draft that's more focused on controlling the map and controlling the objective you've got the mm. wisp for zone control you've got lunara and artanis both who have talents that can um, make their draft 
deal with the immortal a lot easier so i definitely like that on boeing if they can focus on the objective here i think that they may have ran away with an easier draft to satisfy uh their win conditions we'll see though because cerner's team fight is so strong i just uh adjusted some of the the levels real quick so hopefully that gets that's that's good to go by the time we thank you jump into the thing because yeah, i'm good i'm good I'm, 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 I'm. <laughs> But here we go. Game number one. Let's get started. On the left side, we have the members of Boeing. Sipping on that jet fuel. This is me. He's on Jaina. Myeri is on White Mane. Archie's playing Lunar. Exact is on Artanis. And Ek will be burrowing with Anubarak. Ladies and gentlemen, game number one on the right in red is Cerner. We got Mayog on Maiev. Sicrobax on Diablo. Coldam on Sonya. Sin playing Natalie Ming. And Tulio on Malfurion. These are good names. Names that I've never got to say before. I like these names. Me likey. I'm doing ob stuff too, so uh, get your T-Tours ready in the chat. <laughs> so there it is, that amateur opponent picked up for Artanis as we... Uh, thought it would come through. It's super powerful on this map, allowing your twin blades to deal 150% bonus damage to non-heroes. And of course, the main objective of this game is a non-hero, so going to help a lot securing that objective for Boeing. I'm gonna be keeping an eye on C Crovex quite a bit throughout the course of the game. Diablo, a strong first pick in almost every regard. I'm also looking at Mihawk's health bar, who's seen better days. But on a two lane battleground with Diablo, once that 100 souls are stacked up, the moment Diablo potentially gets taken down, that is a huge momentum swing against the potential success for Cern and Sora's late game. It's gonna be that much more difficult to get him stacked up. Gonna be a beefy boy at 100, not so much at. Only real question mark for level one talent so far is the Astral Presence picked up by Li Ming. You know, having the likes of a Innervate on your team, I'm not sure if this is the best level one to go, especially considering just how powerful um, Power Hungry is on this map in general. You can dip into that side lane, you can pick up a globe. Of course, when the objective is finished, there's globes there as well. But uh, we'll see how that one ends up playing out here. But so far, the early game, just a little bit of throws being or spells being thrown out, but nothing too crazy. This is what I thought we would see in the top lane as far as the Artanis Sonya matchup goes. Coldam Sonya is definitely going to be up to the task to apply consistent, solid pressure onto the Artanis. The value of that pick will really come online once the first Immortal phase shows up with the amateur opponent. But for right now, this is a lane that could very well go over towards the Sonya just based on raw damage output and tradeability alone. Yeah, she's such a good duelist against the Artanis. That's. Honestly, when Artanis first came out, Sonya was one of those picks that was showing up frequently as a counter. Mayok taking a lot of damage. Sikrovax going in for a little bit of an engagement, but uh, Nubrax a slippery fellow. I like Krovax was there for the peel also. I think the uh, tandem effort of Diablo and Maiev is going to be very important. Get the nice Shadow Charge into an Overpower to isolate someone. Having that Maiev pull afterwards is going to be the difference between someone getting taken out or not. Especially if they can jump onto that white main and force that into a defensive posture we'll see uh, over the first set of uh immortals but right now both teams having a solid understanding of the meta and ebb and flow kyle both going for their bruce camps that's actually so exciting i just got nerd chills just seeing both of these teams walk up to their fallen shaman camp right on time nature's culling coming in for the lunara so boeing's draft right now has a power spike on this immortal if they're able to get any race time with the lunara and the artanis they can very well run away with the early stages of this game but Cerner, again, with their team fight capabilities. It's Diablo and Maiev are never something to scoff at. We'll see if uh, Cerner can find the right angles. Right now, it looks like Cerner is deciding whether or not they want to be aggressive or defend. They do have the four man unit together, rotates in. There's some orbs. X is going to go ahead and do a little bit of fishing with the impale, finds Mayok for their trouble. But the name of the game has to be deal with these bruiser camps. Don't let that passive value start to amass early on. And then see how we want to play it. But right now, Coldam gets caught with the stun. Unfortunate, unlucky. That is going to be first blood. Coldam gets to chill for a moment. Stepping up much too far into not only the enemy's immortal range, but just so much lockdown that Boeing brought to that equation. Ek 
capitalized on the positioning of Sonya, found that first blood, and now the rotation from Boeing coming through to just try to secure as much damage as possible onto this Immortal. Nice job by Boeing. Yeah, this composition on the side of Boeing is going to be able to seize on every opportunity like that. You eat that Immortal stun, there's going to be some follow-up in, in the form of the Anubrak afterwards that paves the way for the halftime show to be about, and it is going to get kicked off. Slight experience lead, you gotta watch your position. Ek doing such a nice job too of just positioning in front of the Li Ming to drop those beetles to stop Sin's spells from coming through. You see it right there. It just makes it super difficult for, for Sin to really find a whole lot of damage. But meanwhile, Cerner are coming in. They're finding the combinations. Ek in a little bit of trouble. Cerner's not looking to give this up just yet. Colam's gonna step forward, already back to business, being on the aggressive front as Sonya. That's exactly what you need to do. But this long range poke from Boeing, you know, we've been talking about the Li Ming, but Janna can do the exact same thing. We also have Lunara able to be able, being able to poke successfully. So unless there's some serious aggression on the side of Cerner, it does look like the first immortal will be getting snapped up by the Flyboys and Gal over at Boeing. Which is basically what we expected with this style of draft. We'll see if Boeing can just secure it right now because Sin's doing a nice job at least eliminating some of that shield. But Boeing likely just going to step in here, start focusing on this objective. Throwback's actually taking a lot of damage. In trouble is this Diablo. This is me also taking a bunch of damage. Cold, I'm trying to escape the clutches of Boeing, but that's going to be another death. Level 7's coming through for Boeing. No need for the swap. You can go ahead and just send the HP bar down to zero. That is going to be two takedowns in favor of Boeing, who found themselves in a very nice position there. Not only do you claim their immortal with a decent shield on it, but if you can snap away a takedown, maybe two there, that is how you start to snowball the early portion of the game of Battlefield of Eternity. Cerner making a decision to try to hang around there and fight proved to be something of a liability. If you are going to commit to that defense, Kyle, you just got to go in and start hit hunting. Otherwise, you find yourself in a position exactly like this. And a full level up is nothing to scoff at, especially given this current patch. Boeing pushed out the bottom lane as well, and six or so minions were missed in that uh, situation. So Cerner are losing on every section of the map at this point. But this is what we anticipated would happen. Boeing's draft is definitely better on the objective. Cerner's draft really comes online at that level 10. They just have to try to stay within range of their opponents until that point. Cerner right now down but certainly not out they are able to hang on to their fort that is going to help them at least maintain uh the the pressure not have to deal with that too much don't have to worry about that extra catapult for the moment they're already making decisions on the macro front moving up to deal with some of the potential pressure down the road by picking up this siege camp right now we see boeing wasting no time either i really like that both of these teams they seem to be thinking at least two steps ahead with every decision that they make it's cool to see it is. I, I like the fact that they're also just doing everything as a team. So they're rotating around as a unit, just making sure that they're picking things up, having their tanks sit in bushes to control vision and stuff like that. Sometimes you don't even see that um, in some open division teams. So this mm. is it's fantastic to see the teamwork coming out from these corporations. Right now, down, down the bottom lane, they've already gone through this wall. Exact is enjoying the pressure he's able to apply there. Coldam, we saw them put the screws to Artanis early on. They're going to look to do exactly that yet again up at the top lane. We see Mayog and crew seeing if they can get some kind of value on the overall structure front. Archie steps forward, gets some harass on the Mayav just to force them back. Right now, the second immortal, second second set of immortals of the game will be showing up. Artanis is already rotating back to the Bruiser camp, and so the macro dance continues. Going ahead on this race to level 10, that bottom wave is going to be pushed in as well. So this is going to put Boeing into a commanding position for a little bit of time here. And this is the problem when you go down a level um, during the early game. If you miss some experience, it, it can kind of compound the issues that you faced on that first Immortal. Because now Boeing are going to have the opportunity to step up with their level 10s and see if they can maybe try to force a fight. They'll have the cocoon likely. So it's something that they can do, but... Cerner are blessed here in the fact that this is um, racing style positions for the Immortal. But that being said, Boeing came out way ahead on it. Yeah, I was going to say that Cerner was on track to make a stand past the halftime show once they got the level 10, but the race potential of Boeing is through the roof. Before Ooh. the Archies are going to be available for Cerner, this Immortal is already spoken for with about an 80%, 85% shield in tow also. That is going to be quite the formidable, formidable foe. Looking at heroics, though, we do see Cocoon, Suppression Pulse, not surprised there. Leaping Strike, so Lunar is looking to get a little risky. Scarlet Aegis, Water Elemental, Warden's Cage. Bit of an engage coming on here. Boy. 
X in a lot of trouble. That 60 armor not going to be enough. And Anubarak goes down in this equation. Cerner find that blow up onto that tanky frontline target of Boeing. Nice pick. That's what they needed. They really needed to take some of the wind out of Boeing's sails. And that's kind of a pun that I didn't really expect since they're an aviation company. <laughs> but here we are anyway. Oh, that's going to help them burn down the Immortal Shield. There's a nice overpower. Archie eats an orb from Li Ming. The mage says hello. Nice two-person yank. Mayak gonna go ahead and try to further force the issue. Twilight Dream, but only he himself ends up getting silenced. That is going to be another takedown. This okay, is me is on it. Bodying everybody. Walked onto the <laughs> back line of that team fight. Finds two picks despite being down a hero. Meanwhile, top lane. Um, exact is just pushing this this entire time. Boeing being down numbers just found their way in that team fight. And I have to say that that almost entirely boiled down to this is me walking past the front line of Cerner, finding those that damage onto the back line. Like he almost one shot Malfurion and then turned around and killed Sin as well. Really nice job by Jaina. Cerner's got two modes, man. Sleep and ham. They've been, they've either just been chilling or they're going all in. They don't mind losing a hero or three if it means we stop your advance by our time getting towards a late game and then we can try to find an advantage down the road. They need to keep that kind of aggression with this frontline tandem of Diablo and Maev. They get the right Twilight Dream. Tulio stepped forward already about half health by the time that decision got made. They're able to do something better with that. They'll fare much better later on. But that was an APOC that netted not too much value, Colin. Yeah, tried to find This Is Me in that corner there, but wasn't able to get any follow-up damage. And yet, that's going to be 90-second cooldown on APOC. So it gives Boeing an opportunity to try to maybe find a fight without that heroic being available. But at the same time, they're a little bit ahead on their way to level 13. They've got top pressure. Oh, they did have top pressure. That camp just died. But they've got more map pressure. So instead, they could also just look to try to control some vision at this point. Maybe look for a sneaky pick in one of these bushes. It feels to me, Kala, like Cerner on paper is the more aggressive team and just how they're trying to take these team fights. But Boeing's doing a really good job of nullifying that and managing to stay ahead and on experience based off of that one fight at the very beginning of the game over the Immortal. But right now, we do see Cerner to a degree starting to close the gap on experience. They should have level 13 by the time the next set of Immortal shows up. The heroic advantage was such a huge impact that allowed Boeing to get a big shield on their second Immortal earlier with... The tiers now being evened up, this could be the big turning point for Cerner. Bruiser camp's just off timing, so that's why we're not seeing either of these teams look to start those. And Cerner are just so slow on starting their immortal damage. They allow Boeing to just get immediately onto that objective and get the race, I wouldn't say well ahead of their opponents, but 4,000 damage is not something to scoff at. And you, you definitely... It looked like Cerner tried to test the waters of how much they can race, but uh, Lunara and Artanis both, that is going to be quite the race to try to catch up to. Right now, the name of the game looks to be Defense. Heck, out on an island, there's a nice swap onto the back line. Artanis is waking Sin up. The Cocoon puts Maev on his Zach Morris timeout, but there's a nice Twilight Dream on three members of Boeing. X Zach on the ropes. The Immortal Stun's going to have an impact also. X trying to get the heck out of dodge. Low health bars on the side of Cerner. X Zach gets yanked back in. Maev was first to fall. It's a one for one so far. Arkies chasing in, trying to find as much damage as possible. Tulio is so low, down goes another, and Cerner are just getting cleaned up at this point. Boeing trade the one for four, and likely will get this objective as well. Krovax not able to find another stun onto Archie, and that was an explosive fight. Boeing were in a bad place, considering the fact that they're fighting on the opponent's immortal, as well as that Apoc and Twilight Dream both getting a lot of value, but Boeing survived. This white main's Scarlet Aegis was fantastic. And the sustain was just there for Boeing. They find the victory in the team fight, and that's another immortal going their way. It's that white main pick, Kyle. Ho, 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 yep. ho, 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 with the chuckling. That is the one support in this game that just shifts the overall dynamic of a team fight. Sometimes it's a takedown, then there's a white man that shows up, and it's not. Even with those immortal stuns, I thought that Artanis' life was definitely going to be taken out pretty soon at the beginning portion of that fight, but they somehow were able to hang on. All time, Boeing is out here making plays right now. I'm trying to find a universe where Ice Barrier is the 13 talent pick up here for Jaina, but I'm not able to locate it. I really do think that this is a misplay on the side of Jaina, needing that Icy Veins. The extra burst damage is just so fantastic at, at dealing with the scaling of Sonya, um, and of course the elusiveness of Maev, and even just dealing with the frontline of Diablo, but we'll see if that one ends up paying off. You know, Jaina has been surviving in these teamfights, so 
it is working for her. But meanwhile, Boeing pushing in, Cerner need to make a response. I really like the peel there from Ek. The moment Coldan jumped into the back, there was right there for the stun, and nice Twilight Dream is gonna come out. The keep definitely gonna be spoken for. Malfurion taken down, the swap goes out, just misses on that Lee Ming, but Ma Mayok, K. Krovax, they are definitely trying to get back towards base, and it looks like Boeing's gonna be more than happy to fly them back there, and they're turning their eyes towards this core column. Game one looks to be in the hands of both. Finds another swap, but it doesn't matter. Boeing pushing in, looking to make this a 1-0 in the grand finals here, and that's GG. Ladies and gentlemen, Boeing, I you know, that's 13 kills to four. They drafted a composition for the map. I think that they played a little bit tighter as a team, and that was definitely a well-deserved victory. I got to give MVP over there to, um, to This Is Me, though, on Jaina, making big plays in those team fights. Big plays indeed, 31,000 hero damage. Lunara had 33 also. So when you do have a playmaker like This Is Me's Jaina, supported by, you know, Lunar, who is able to just hang back, and while they don't look super flashy, they're definitely out there kicking the numbers. It's it's going to be a problem for the enemy team. Uh, White Man had 38,000 healing compared to Malfurion's 24. So with that much damage being kicked out yeah. on top of your sustain, you're going to look pretty good in these team fights. Uh, just based off the of numbers alone, you can't be too shocked to see Bowen coming out on top in game one. Cerner was close, right? Um, so in two different situations, one, Cerner, uh, they had... Sonya just walk into a bush at one point and ended up giving first blood. That was a problem. Um, if you eliminate that sort of uh, disrespect of a kill comp like this Jaina and Anubrak, then you don't end up giving first blood there. You don't lose some of your early game pressure. But at the same time, we also found moments where Boeing were doing a four-man race on the Immortal, and you could see that by the numbers, mm -hmm. just racing down. Also, it, in Vision, uh, Cerner were able to actually see Boeing rotate up during the early game. I would have liked to see Cerner, instead of putting four people into their bot lane just to deal with that Fallen Shaman camp during the first objective, just race. Even though your race isn't going to win, at it, it at least will transition you into only having maybe a 20% shield to deal with instead of that overwhelming 50, 60, 70% shields that we saw. Cerner were like five, six seconds behind their opponents in almost every rotate, and that's really what ended up making them lose this early game they're also taking some bad fights in some specific spaces but cerner if they're able to start drafting a little bit more for the map play a little bit tighter and a little bit faster i think this is going to be a very even series i i think that i personally would strongly consider banning out the white man if you're not going to be able to get them yep so uh again i ring that bell of white man just being that that character that just changes things uh, you think that you're going to have the kill, and surprise, surprise, oh wait, they have an insane amount of bur uh, sustain. Uh, it's like you're dealing with every like a five-man garage team, pretty much. It's just like <laughs> armor and sustain for days, and you're just like, well, guess we don't get that kill, and now we're overextended, so I guess we just die. That's kind of what we saw happen. Yeah, it's also crazy seeing the difference in a new barack now. I love the fact that armor has been changed a little bit, and now Anub can run in with 60 armor on his W. It makes him so scary against mages like a Lee Ming, whose who's damage deals in rotations. She throws out mm. her spells, especially against an Anub, man. Half of her spells get blocked by beetles, the other half <laughs> land into 60 armor. And it's like, okay, cool. <laughs> I'm barely even a hero at this point. I was very impressed with X positioning, um, especially at that, that in-game push in the top lane. We saw Coldam try to sneak past to get onto the back line and then he immediately left the keep and jumped back to, to protect the back line with the burrow and you, you also put yourself in a, a nice spot because when you use your e aggressively as a new brack it's hard it immediately goes on your back so having the the presence of mind to walk forward and be a presence there and then burrow back as needed uh that kind of synergy the main tank main in me love seeing that sort of play so yeah props to egg for sure Next map, ladies and gentlemen, are gonna be. Er, it's gonna be on Infernal Shrines. Um, so again, I want to see Cerner step up their draft a little bit and maybe focus more on the map because last time it was all on the team fight. Maybe with a little bit more focus on the heroes that can control this shrine, Cerner will be able to play a little bit closer because their their rotations to camps were actually fantastic. Everything was timed really well. They um they traded out the top Kazer camps as well against Boeing. It was just the speed of their delivery and a little bit of a shortcoming in draft. So we'll see if something gets changed up here. Just updating the scores for the match screen because I'm good at this and I know what I'm doing. 
So very similar <laughs> bans for this uh, for this game number two. Cerner banning off that Kerrigan. Kerrigan on this map, very, very strong. Actually, almost completely even, as well as this Johanna. Orphea banned out for Boeing. What's this next one going to be? Last time it was a Garrosh. I do like the idea that Cerner's committed to the game plan. We're actually just going to see the same bans from, from last time. But again, Kala, I got to echo the importance and value that that white main brought to the table. Um, on this battleground in particular, I totally understand why you'd want to ban out the Kerrigan. Johanna, to a lesser extent, like, yeah, she can help steal away some of the defenders with her condemn. But, uh, are, are, is this the Matrix, Kala? Yeah, like, I know, right? <laughs> is the, the cat remember? walking by it twice? Dude, this is giving me some um, <laughs> e Kevin vibes. Just locking in that early Jaina. If it works, then keep running with it. You know, Jaina White Main aren't a consistent one two for a lot of teams, but it definitely worked last game. I also just really like the Jaina to control any front line. Being able to, to run those consistent slows really, really helps. Meanwhile, on the other side, it's the Kale Thos this time instead of Li Ming. So Kale Thos a little bit more um focused on the map having that those aoe spells to control the shrine so i definitely like the cerner have at least made that change i think it's a great adjustment um the first deviation from this draft is going to be that and you, you were talking about the impact that anubrek had last game with the beetles eating the orbs and stuff kale Thos doesn't have to worry about that it actually it's like hey you want to keep your beetles around and let that chain bomb spread that puts a smile on my face we are going to see anubrek show up again Ek played that character very well. Not surprised to see them just not fix what isn't broken. I do like these adjustments from Cerner, though. The global pressure that the hacker brings to the table could be a new dynamic to help them get their first win of this series. Yeah, this is good. Uh, globals in general have skyrocketed in value on this new patch just because of how powerful a minion soak is so having that dahaka is going to be a wonderful asset for cerner oh, yeah. rounding off the draft for boeing is a rex star a sentence i never thought i'd say <laughs> Risha. okay i see you out here Bowen. i see you okay Wait, it's beautiful it's, it's a work of art i'm really stoked to see this one honestly the jaina phoenix combination with women and anub i i think already that that four man for boeing is is massive i don't know about the rexar this has to be a comfort pick for sure i remember reading some notes about a rexar but uh we'll see how strong misha is in this equation but cerner's draft i think i would have to agree with you much much better this time around i see an instance where cerner tries to get on to rexar in particular over the objective fight but again that white main is there so it's like all right let me have diablo shadow charge in on the rexar we can blow him up and then misha's gone and everything's gonna be cool right somehow rexar doesn't die and then now everybody's overextended and what we saw last time could happen again but going into game number two we will find out on the left side it is boeing this is me playing Phoenix. Archie is on Jaina. My Aerie will be playing White Main. X Axe shifting over towards the Rex Stars here. You know? And then X gonna be rounding it out once again on the Anubaret. I like that. Boeing mixing it up with the with the Jaina player this time. But on the right in red is Cerner in this game number two. Down one game, it's Mayog on Maev. Krovax on Diablo. Kolem on Dahaka. Sin playing the Kale Thos and Tulio on Malfurion. I really want to see what kind of added dynamic Dahaka brings to the table. Uh, this being a three lane battleground, if the objective, the first fender fight is going to be in the top lane, do we see Cold Am rotate down towards the bottom lane, get that added soak, maybe get a tower, maybe two, maybe eat through the entire wall if it's experience that could have an impact later on, especially if they're able to get the fort going towards the mid game. Those catapults will add some push going in. I do like this tight knit rotation with the four man unit. Yep. Both teams, we, we saw them do this to a degree last game, but now this is a three lane rotation. It's cool also to see this, this tight knit dynamic. Cerner definitely quicker on this rotation so far, but I would have liked to see if they could perhaps control the mid jungle a little bit better. They'll have rotational advantage again over their opponents. So we'll see if they do it the second time around or if they just decide to run at the Khazra camp. And it looks like it's going to be the latter. 
Sin, Tulio, and Mayog already starting this one off. Meanwhile, on the side of Boeing, you've got those members starting this camp as well. Krovax just trying to stack up his souls in this bottom lane. Meanwhile, top, this is actually a pretty difficult scenario for the Dahaka to be in. Um, you know, he's able to sustain a lot, but um, if he can't land tongues onto the Rexar, then it's just going to be free poke the entire time. Yeah, he's, he's going to be getting harassed. The, the more he tries to stack up that essence, the more he's leaving himself out there for this exact kind of engagement. Cold Nam's kind of missing Sonya at this moment, I'm sure, but the global pressure is going to bring a lot. Nice drag in the tower range. It's doing damage, but uh, it, all you're really doing is attacking Exag's mana bar because that E key is going to be there. Really nice job on Cerner to not miss any soak in the bottom lane. Mayav was the one to just quickly rotate down there and pick that one up. I'd like to see Cerner clear it fast clear this wave and then maybe just start bottom camp. See what they can do with their early game aggression. They've so far dictated the pace of this game and I like it, but they do need to make sure that they catch this mid wave and it looks like Mayog is uh, heading up to, to catch that. Oh no, so they're gonna miss the entire mid wave. They might be missing White Man if this goes the way Cerna wants it to go. That's a lot of damage going in. First blood. White Man is going to get blown up. You gotta watch the rotation. I was just saying, I really would like to see Cerna get on the aggressive front here. You have the Diablo. You have them. I have the follow up. You know that both teams are rotating as a four man unit. If you catch that right opportunity to get it on the back line, a new Brack's only gonna be able to do so much. That could be the key to success for them to claim their first game in this series. They bought them a little bit of time so that they could pick up this bottom Kazra camp as well. So that's going to allow Cerner to have constant pressure in this bottom lane, which is fantastic for the early stages of the game. Last game, we saw Cerner fall a little bit behind during the early game. So it's nice that they were able to pick this one up. Meanwhile, a little bit of an engagement going on to Ek, but uh, no follow-up damage there. That burrow just going to bring a Nubarak to safety. I think that just had more of a psychological impact. It's like, hey, look, I will press this Q key if I even think you're out of position. Even that alone just forces out a more defensive posture because you don't want to be caught out of position. That sort of passive play, I feel, or that gesture to encourage passive play is what is allowing Cerner to get so far ahead in the defender count. Even without a global pressure, we don't see Boeing really trying to do too much about this. They do wade in, but with 34 already racked up, Kyle, it might be too late. Ooh, this is me with the really nice warp to safety. Sin now getting engaged on by Boeing. Can they find the kill of Kale Toss? They secure their first blood here. Can they get any more? Meanwhile, on this bottom side of the fight, this is me taking a lot of damage from Krovax, but now he's on the back side of this. Has no escape at this point. Do Boeing have the damage? Jaina damage comes through. One more auto attack from this is me, and that's two kills in this equation. I'm not sure if this is a net positive trade for Cerner at the end of the day. Yeah, you come away with the Mortal Punisher, but arguably that's the weakest of the three. You lost two heroes. One thing that I saw there, Kyla, is that C. Krovax had all their attention onto this is me. And that allowed Sin to be taken down effectively for free without any sort of peel. And without the rest of the team to follow up, Diablo does a lot of damage on his own, but not enough to where I feel like he can venture off on his own at the expense of his backline. If they get on the same page there, they'll feel they will fare better in these team fights. But they can't just leave Kael'thas out there to dry like that. I completely agree with you. If Cerner are able to just kind of align their heroes in the same manner, I really do think they're going to see a lot more success. Similar to how they killed the white main in the early stages of the game. They found the shadow charge into the wall. All of the damage followed up onto that same target, and boom, they walk away with first blood. If they're able to do that in these team fights, I do agree with you. They're going to see a lot more success. It seems to be the name of the game for Boeing is just play towards the late game. They they went in to that team fight once 34 defenders are already racked up. So effectively, you have to know that they're just like, well, we're, we're not getting this punishment. But we can get enough kills to where they effectively get no value out of theirs. And then we can try to start to trickle head on an experience that that plan could definitely work out for them. We'll see if they employ that around a 12 13 mark or if they do want to try to go in early on to come away with punishers of their own shadow charge goes in the overpower not going to be able to connect leaving c krovax overextended for the moment kalthos gets the flame strike out just trying to get some kind of poke damage but that is an aggressive engagement that doesn't really do too much for sunny Divert power, weapons, the level seven for Phoenix. Not one you see too frequently, so I'm excited to see how it works in these team fights. It's a, it's a scary talent to choose, especially given the current state of Phoenix, you know, having a lot more of his power built into his his shield. So without that, it's a, it can be pretty rough. We'll see if Phoenix is able to stay, survive and, and use that additional damage to really push himself 
um, ahead of the likes of Jaina as a damage dealer in this composition. Speaking of pretty rough, this is a standard talent for Misha, but aspect of the beast picked up at level seven means that those stuns are going to be there more often than not. In the hands of a capable player that understands when to apply lockdown to their enemy, having that point click available, you think you're about to get away? This would be a good time for Malfurion to, to drop their Twilight Dream. It'd be a shame if I pressed my W key and stunned them <laughs> right at that moment. That is definitely something I'll be trying to keep my eye on in these team fights. Anytime I see a strong Rexar player, it's always very exciting for me. So Cerner have an opportunity now to put their global in a polar opposite position for the next objective. As we do see on the map, it will be spawning on the top side. So I would like to see Cerner rotate out there to Hawk and have him be somewhere that's a little bit more of an advantage for Cerner at this point. But we're seeing Coldham still stick around in the top side of this map. And I do think that's a problem. Meanwhile, mid being pushed in again, Cerner have missed almost four entire minion waves so far this game. And that is a huge problem given this current patch. Meanwhile, Mayog coming in, face checking a bush, taking a lot of damage, but the Kale Foss is dealing out damage as well. Mayog survives on this one. Sin is in a lot of trouble, but that's a one for one trade. That is a nice job there. I thought Mag was going to get taken down at absolutely no cost to Boeing. So even turning it around into a one for one trade is not the worst case scenario. Nicely done. Nice backflip. Kept them alive long enough. But the ultimate, the heroic from Phoenix afterwards, well timed. I thought Mag was actually going to be able to sneak their way out of there. But that Shrine was is close. Yeah. Shrine is now active. Both teams rotating up. This one is definitely going to be a topic of conversation. Exact in a lot of trouble here actually can Coldam land the Q rooted up now is that Rexar he's taking so much damage but White Mane is keeping him alive oh my gosh he actually walks away from this one Tulio opted to hang on to the Twilight Dream finds oh. the right moment for it and oh no dominoes start to fall on the side of Boeing they're gonna go ahead and crash land after that one Eka's gonna go to get him back away has the whale available to him five defenders starting to rise now for CERN who find themselves enjoying the ultimate results of that team fight that's the kind of explosive value we need to see out of Twilight Dream that's the kind of follow-up we need to see and that AoE splash damage from Kalthos is not to be ignored beautiful twilight absolutely fantastic to to secure the victory in that team fight for cerner meanwhile immediately cold ham rotated into the middle lane to just start to get as much value off of that team fight as possible arcane punisher going over to cerner mid wave value for cerner immediately dahaka into this bottom side and of course he still has that brush stalker available i believe actually no that's on cooldown for 45 more seconds so rexar is also down bottom this is an honest 4v4 on the top side of the map with his arcane punisher so cerner is still happy with this I really like seeing the splash damage we saw out of the Kale class there. They're, with so much chaos going on in team fights, a flame strike is going to net value. Chain bombs are going to net value. You have added bodies from the Beatles. X is going to go ahead and get roasted. Roasted Beetle for lunch? Okay. I see you out here, Cerner. They're going to help themselves to the first four of the game. Now they have a slight experience lead. Both teams rounding the corner of level 13. What you were looking to have happen in team fights is happening right now for Cerner. And to compound on what you were talking about, it makes it even worse because Kael'thas' level 7 talent, the Sun King's Fury, just allows those um, living bomb spreads to do so much more damage. Pyromaniac now coming through. So this Kael'thas, I love the fact that Cerner decided to go with a draft that is more centric on this map, exact in a bit of trouble. Oh my gosh, Cerner don't actually look for that fight. They weren't sure where the rest of Boeing were, but that should have been a free um, execute onto the Rexar on the bottom side. They had to have seen Phoenix in the top lane, I believe. I think the last minions were starting to fall there, so maybe they could have decided to be more aggressive. I do like the idea of playing it conservatively. You don't know for sure where the rest of the team is, so you don't want to overextend. This is one of the first times where we can objectively say Sterner has a lead in this series so the last thing you want to do potentially is to be Jaina. over even give that away but oh no Jaina that's going to be a teleport forward every day of the week and the yoink afterwards Jaina's on ice seven takedowns to four in favor of Cerner ice barrier not able to keep her alive and of course the improved ice block not available yet only 8,000 damage out of 15 so it's just not quite there Robax looking for an engage on the Phoenix Cerner have an opportunity now to really run away with this game Next objective is bottom side. They have the global and their fallen shaman camp is up and it's going to be on a keep wall. So if Cerner make this play over to their bruiser camp, 
um, and, and start that camp up for the next objective, they could they could make a huge macro play here. We'll see if they're able to find it. That's such a good point, Kyla. There is a lot potentially on the table here for the team in red. They get the Bruiser camp at the right time. They deal with Boeings at the right time. They leave the Haka in the top lane to push yep. the absolute pickings out of that keep wall and then burrow in as needed, potentially in a flanking position. Right now, there is a lot to be had if you are a Cerner, if they play it correctly. We see you right now, Cold Am starting to rotate up towards the top to deal with this Bruiser camp before the next Immortal is announced. They could look to go all in with this macro play. I want to see them find it. I know the wheels are turning. I know they're considering it. Tulio rotating onto the top side, considering starting this Bruiser camp. They need to get this out. This could be one of the biggest plays that we've seen Cerner make as, as far as macro decisions so far in this series. And it looks like they are starting it here. Fantastic job by Cerner. They got to hang on to this camp for just a moment until the objective spawns. If they cap it right away, um, I think it is a little bit of a shortcoming of the potential of this play. Speaking of which, that shrine spawning right away, so it's actually fine now. You see the macro opportunity, I see it. Cerner seems to be seeing it also, but the question I have is, is Boeing seeing it? Because absolutely no one right now is rotating up top to even put chip damage onto this Bruiser camp. Exact is in the mid lane, just watching the push from Cerner, not really doing too much about it. But also we're actually seeing Coldam rotate down also, so maybe this opportunity is gonna be missed on both sides. 16s here for Cerner. Galaxy brain play in the top lane. Cerner have everything going for them right now. Can Boeing find a fast fight? Right now, this could be a big turning point for it's Boeing. There's Cocoon. They're gonna go ahead and put Maev on timeout for the moment. Lightning Breath just to bail Maev out of jail right away. There's the Mayok talk into the Twilight Dream, and you know the E key's getting mashed by a Nubarak X is going to get taken down. The nice first kill of this engagement by Cerner. And man, they, Boeing are having a very difficult time dealing with this Kale Thos. Boeing are clustering up. They don't have the ability for a noob to really remove any of those spells from hitting because they are AoE spells on the ground instead of something that maybe those beetles can block. And, and, and Boeing are having such a difficult time with it. Looking at these damage numbers, you're seeing Kale Thos hit that 18,000. While it's not as much as someone like the Rexar, Rexar was basically just beating on the Dahaka during lane. So the numbers are a little bit inflated. So Kale Thos is just making big plays here. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to argue with the value you had out of the Bruiser camp. The decision to send Dahaka right in at the beginning of the fight definitely netted values. Looks to be the right call in the long run. It seemed like Boeing was trying to take that fight to them right at the beginning. So having the Dahaka there was the right play in the grand scheme of things. The Cerner played back a bit more. They could have maybe had Dahaka stay up and get value. But here we are, Frozen Punisher looking to jump over the wall. That's going to get baited correctly by the new wreck. See, Krovac jumps in, gets the Scooby here out going in so deep. There's the Yank, there's the root afterwards. The new wreck is going to be able to burrow away. Mayok at half health finds himself the recipient of the Phoenix Heroic. Not going to be enough to get taken down, and this is me might be overextended. Yeah, Salvo almost finding a kill there onto Mayok, but not quite now. The members of Cerner going in. Killing off Misha, not able to pick up a keep, but this wall is a lot. That's still a full level lead here for Cerner. And then they have the additional passive experience from top lane and bottom lane at this point. So Cerner are in such a good position. Really, really nice plays over the past five minutes. Right now, Cerner is playing a very meticulous, methodical game. They're being aggressive in situations that call for it and in situations where they can see it working in their favor. A more aggressive team, a team that isn't thinking towards the long run, might have tried to push for that bottom keep, died, and then forfeited whatever momentum that they had gained. But the decision to just let that Punisher buy them a free escape and leave them in this position, it that's the decisions you see out of a top-tier team. I really like seeing that kind of play. We see Exact rotating around, potentially spotting out. One ping is showing a potential invasion response. Echoes around the corner, gets immediately yanked. Shadow Charge goes in, overpower, not gonna be there. The burrow is away. Ek is for sure awake right now. Cerner had the opportunity to rip a Twilight Dream there off of the stun to, to silence that Anubarak to make sure that he couldn't go over the wall, but not willing to spend it at this point. Maybe the single heroic not worth the kill for them, but it could have got mid fort. It looks like Cerner is stepping up to be able to pick up this mid fort anyways. Lightning Breath ripped as well. Cerner just 
spending some heroics here to just get some pressure in this mid lane. They're committed. They're not going to be able to get the get the middle fort that they were looking for. And oh Sin. no, Zen is low one out. There's the aggressive burrow to lock out the fire mage cocoon afterwards. Twilight Dream goes down, lands on three members of Boeing. Definitely could be a turning point. My app is going to hit the deck. That's going to be my experience sitting the rest of this one out. Also, the short range teleport is going to help. This is me get away. But right now, it is a fire sale. Boeing is flying high, taking down four heroes on the side of certain beautiful counter engage by Boeing. I'm not sure what Cerner were thinking, just stepping up and spending that lightning breath on the fort like that. It certainly wasn't something that they needed to do. Cerner were so far ahead when it came to experience, they could have just looked at perhaps waiting out the, the longer game, getting that level 20 ahead of their opponents, and then just focusing on the next objective. Maybe even using that objective to push mid and then rotate to the bottom lane or something like that with a camp and maybe pick up the first keep. But Cerner, they just... They wanted to spend their resources and try to look for a fight, and Boeing fought back. Right as I was complimenting their meticulous, methodical play, they decide to be super ham YOLO, and it comes back to bite them. <laughs> not only do they not come away with this middle fort, they lose four heroes, they lose Diablo souls. And one thing that I've noticed over the course of this game, Kala, is the value or strategy being placed behind a Nubrax Burrow. Anytime we've seen Ek Burrow back defensively, we see Cerner playing up. But the moment it's aggressive, Kael'thas is gone. So as yep. long as they can position themselves to allow Ek to be aggressive with the Burrow, we could see more team fights like that go their way. Definitely true. Arcane Barrier, of course, online has been for a while here for the Kael'thas. So he has a lot of survivability built into his kit. We'll see if Sin can stay alive for longer because that's really the playmaker here that I'm seeing in this game number two. 30,000 heroic damage rivaled only by Jaina on the opposite team. So lots of damage coming out from this hero. And of course, that Ignite, so powerful. Flamethrower now, Sin able to deal damage from so far away. It's the battle of the mages at this point here, Lauren. 20 against 20. Still anyone's game. No keeps are taken down. Shadow Charge goes in onto the Misha. The Overpower, can they call Peter? No, looks like the Fire Breath is going to go out. Hold go ahead and close him out. The Burrow. Helps Coldam get out of there. This is me. Gets the shield of the last pops moment. Thank you, level 20 talent. Mayari starting to back away. Seacrovex looks to get involved. Shadow Charge goes in. White Man goes down. The Kael'thas damage was so big again there. Really nice backed up play by Cerner. They re-engaged. Misha was super low. And while it's just Misha, that's still a lot of frontline power that Boeing do have. Now, Exact needs to be careful. He, he could very well just die here if he... He's absolutely dead here, actually. So that's going to be a F in my books. The moment you saw Krovax go around this corner, actually, ooh, oh, I'm not able to nani. get an overpower. Wait, nani? <laughs> Wait, that was... Okay. Cerner, you're in trouble. Left one on the table. The community coach is going to sit, go ahead and say, see me after class. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. Mortar Punisher picked up here. Hello, and still 20 second death timer on the likes of White Mane. So this is going to be, I would like to see Cerner step up and take an early bottom side wall so they can get some pressure. So far, they're not stepping up onto this objective, or onto this structure, sorry. They need to take down these walls so they can look to follow up with the, the Punisher, but not quite able to find it. One might say, you know, it's not the biggest deal when Rexar gets away, but that actually has a very big impact. We could have seen Rexar get taken down, and then Cerner just push the top lane, and then split the divided attention yep. of Boeing. Do we let the Punisher push for free in mid lane, or do we respond up top? Either way, it looks like this middle keep is going to get taken down, so value is had one way or the other, but with this Punisher just take, taken down as low already, this does buy Boeing an opportunity to turn things around and take the late game. Whereas that Rexar kill might have been the beginning of the year. Keep in mind, there are one, two, three, four, five talents that Rexar are running that are Misha relevant. So having Misha die in these fights basically turns Rexar even more than normal into a non existent hero. So I would like to see Exact playing a little bit safer with the likes of Misha. Needs to be more careful. Keep her alive. That Bestial Wrath isn't something that's even possible without a beast to begin with. Janin's going ahead and getting out the janitor with mop and broom. Go ahead and clean up the mid lane. Rotation is up to take some of the pressure off of this top lane. Tower is going to get taken down. It was already pretty much one shot away. Anyway, both teams are past level 20, so the experience advantage isn't necessarily there. But every little bit counts at this point. If you can get the catapult down there to deal with the keep itself rather than that tower it's just more macro pressure to potentially deal with or to just get an advantage off of if you're Cerner who have to feel like they're in a very commanding position right now 
Yeah, they have consistent pressure across all lanes, which is fantastic for them. It buys them so much space on the map. And when you have that much space with a Kael'thas, Maiev, Malfury, not even talking about the Dahaka, but the Diablo as well, it just, it allows you to find so many good angles. Right now, Cerner, they see this Anubarak. He's trying to get away. He actually manages to use the Rewind. Sin in a lot of trouble here. Now silenced up Ooh. is Anubarak. He goes down in this equation. Near perfect coordination with their heroics. We thought Anubrek was just outside of the bouncy castle. Every time I try to get out, you pull me back in. Anubrek gets roasted with the lightning breath afterwards. And we also saw this is me almost get taken out there. Nicely done on all sides. But Cerner couldn't come away with the second keep of the game. And with the middle lane already pushed in, thanks with this siege camp, this could be a 1 1 evening of the score. Cerner's looking to close out the game so much pressure Ek was so very close she's been playing on point for both of these games but just a little bit stepped up too far the rewind wasn't enough for a noob to get to safety and she paid for it but cerner decided not to push in despite having catapults across each lane and the camp um and the long range siege potential of kael'thas but i think this this could be a wise decision as well um, they just have so much pressure in mid and bottom. If they just wait out the top objective, they should be able to get enough pressure to at least threaten the core. You bring up the perfect point. Can they show some patience over this next objective? If they do not go all in, if they do not give the team fight that Boeing effectively needs to try to win this game, sooner or later, someone has to respond to the catapults in the mid and bottom lane. Then you have at least a 4v5 advantage, and then you just kind of easily take the fight from there. But if they do go go all in, if they do play aggressively like we saw them go over the middle fort, this could be a disastrous decision to not try to close out the game back at the core. Let's see if they give him the fight, Kyle. This could be it. Boeing know they have to play fast. They're stepped up super far right here. Krovax doing some damage to Misha. There goes the salvo, but so much damage onto the side of Boeing. Down goes White Mate. Ek in a lot of trouble as well. The counter engage, but Jaina goes down as well. And this is a disaster, Haloran. Lightning Breath could not net any more value. It's going to be hard to chuckle if you're White Mate if you're dead. Lightning Breath, melting health bar, setting up three hero heroes being taken down on the side of Boeing with 22 defenders. This all is starting to feel like quite the formality. Dahak is already rotating, putting further screws on pressure towards this core, clearing out the middle lane way. Burrow helps Ek just get out of there. Krovax is like, meddling kids, man, I'll get you next time. But this is a the... little bit concerning though, because Cerner had 100% end game Red mid team. off of those kills. So they didn't rotate mid. They didn't look to, to end the game there. Instead, picking up the Arcane Punisher. And while this Arcane Punisher also does end the game, it's in le or in more time than it would have taken for them to just five man mid. And now they're kind of figuring it out. They're on the core and Cerner are going to pick up this game in game number two, Haloran. I'm glad that they changed up the draft a bit. They, they cracked the code for sure. I think a big part of this, this is all up from around at this point. The core is definitely going to be taken down here and we're looking yep. at a one for one even score right now between Boeing and Cerner. Both teams, they're playing the win right now. This is the kind of grand finals I had hoped to see. Both teams are definitely showing that they know how to play this video game. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the, a big key there, in my opinion, was the Kael'thas pick. You, you switch yep. from Li Ming to Kael'thas. Not only is that is a, a smart pick for this battleground, but it just seems to be beneficial to their overall play style. 53,000, almost 54,000 hero damage for Sin with a lot of damage that just punishes positioning. And you have Misha to spread the chain bombs. You have the Beatles potentially to spread the chain bombs. Just... You never really saw them spread out to deal with the Kael'thas damage, and that's nope. just going to be easy value all day. Part of me was just even thinking, send the Cocoon onto Kael'thas and push up into a fight, because there's so many times where Cerner were stepping up, you know, 60, 70, 80% of the way across the map, and when Kael'thas gets cocooned like that and you just move into a fight, he really doesn't have a lot of space to operate in. Malfurion didn't run cleanse there, so it would have been even more difficult for Sin to escape those sort of situations. But Boeing just weren't able to, to really find those those engagements, find those angles. And I actually do think, um, despite looking pretty decent in the early game, that the Rexar was a big problem there. Rexar just doesn't bring value to those sort of late game fights. Pretty much at that point, Rexar and Misha were just a living bomb 
um, <laughs> carrier, right? Like, Living Bomb would go out on Amisha, so much damage would come through. Amisha had to come back in. Living Bomb would spread to the objective, gain more value for Cerner. Sometimes it would even hit allied heroes of Boeing, so it became a bit of a problem there. I think that, uh, I think the Rexar pick was a bit of an issue. Uh, I'm invited into the lobby. Let me get you in there. I'm coming, it looks like the teams have switched sides. Okay. I will need to do Anigans here. Um, I I do agree with you that the uh the the Rexar pick proved to be more liability than asset. Um, something that is easy to overlook. Um, when you're dealing with the Kalthas, is, is that there are those added ways for chain bombs to spread. Yeah. Um, you have to to mine your positioning. And in a composition where you do have, you know, a double warrior front line, it's very easy to at least get value off of that alone. Just having, you know, the, the solo laner and the main tank just kind of knocking heads together to spread chain bombs around. And then the more that actually reaches the back line, then the better. So if we do see Kael'thas again, the name of the game for Boeing 100% is going to be a... Uh, stay spread out. If, if we're not going to... I don't think you need to ban Kael'thas. But you definitely need to mine your positioning to, to limit the value because that. <laughs> I love that. That's a problem. People Lauren on our team. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go for the other team. We'll just play against each other. Yeah. And like, this is an important um, grand finals. You know, there's a lot on the line to go towards these charities, and it's. Yeah, and these teams want to win. It's exciting. That was a. It was definitely a lot closer of a second game than the first game. I do think that uh, Cerner stepped it up with their draft a lot. And not just their draft, their play style, too. They seemed a lot faster. You know, they seemed to play alongside each other a lot better. There was a couple times where maybe they got a little bit overambitious, like in that mid lane where they just ripped the lightning breath and got counter-engaged on and then died. So mm -hmm. stuff like that was a little bit scary, but at <laughs> least they did it all as a team. And that's important. You know, you win together and you lose together. It's, it's that simple. Uh, I think we are <laughs> ready. <laughs> Apparently, you, you get they they get you. Yeah. <laughs> Jumping in. Uh, just so you guys, if if anyone's showing up now, um, this is the After Hours Gaming League Grand Finals for Fall 2018 season. After Hours Gaming League um, brings in different teams from different corporations. Like this is the Grand Finals between Boeing and Cerner, but there were over 200 corporations that had teams that that fielded teams not only across heroes of the storm but other things like player unknowns battlegrounds rocket league um just other other things you know some corporate leagues they they do like a softball type of thing but uh this is a really cool ambition to bring gaming into the fold so right now these teams are playing for first place first place will get will give forty five hundred dollars to a charity of their choice the grand total uh, charity amount that's being given away is twenty three thousand. Uh, Boeing is playing for Child's Play. Uh, we're, we're all very familiar with them. And on the other side, Cerner is playing for the First Hand Foundation. Uh, they provide funding for individual children, both domestically and globally, who need assistance with clinical necessities and other medical things. So another very cool organization. So um, it's really cool to see AHGL uh, put this together and give back it's really cool and thank you everyone for being here to support these teams and support this cause and without further ado we're gonna move into game number three here it's gonna be cerner on the left versus boeing on the right it's tied up one one this is volskaya foundry ladies and gentlemen early game drafts very very important securing the first objective very important so i would like to see both of these teams kind of align their compositions to satisfy that condition Hey, the image, there we go. I'm good at this, cow, and I know what I'm doing. I know. Both of those things are very <laughs> true. <laughs> mm, yes. the, the bands are so funny, man. It just same way both times, Kerrigan or Fia. Mm -hmm. Keep keep in mind that the team switch sides. I have updated the images, so now it's Cerner on the left and Boeing on the right. So the deja vu does continue, but we do Ooh. see some variation. Diablo. I get it. White Man was like, I remember what you did to me around level four. I didn't like that in the rotation. I remember what you did to my face with lightning breath at the end of the last game. No thanks. Let's see what else you got. 
I get it. Yellow is scary. I want to see a stitches show up in one of these games. Are we going to find it? I want the stitches. Maybe even a junk rat on this map. Cassia banned out here for Cernus of Boeing with the luxuries of that first pick. What's it going to be for themselves? They found a lot of value in the Jaina pick. But it's going to be Garrosh first time up. Tar Ogar. On Voskaya Foundry, this is a very impactful uh, first pick. You do not want to get thrown out of position on, on this map. It, it is a long way back to safety over these objective phases. We are going to see Johanna get picked up. We saw that band out routinely earlier. So uh, we'll, we'll see what kind of value that brings to the table. Hold in and white main. Okay, Boeing going back to their roots with the white main pick. But uh, Goldan is definitely a variance I like. Yep, running some uh, Orc Cleave here with the Goldan and Garrosh. I like it. The consistent damage from Goldan is always a problem, um, especially if he's able to stack up those that corruption early. It can just it can be absolutely devastating. Goldan's one of my favorite heroes, so I'm really excited to see this one come through. I like the fact that Cerner decided to run a Johanna into the Garrosh. Johanna does very well into Garrosh. So I, I think that was a wise pickup by Cerner because it certainly could have been banned out by Boeing for the second phase. So nice job there to pick it up early. Let's see what they ban out here. Maev, you know, we, we were singing the praises of Diablo at a number of instances over the course of the last game in particular, but Maev has also been quite the problem as well for Boeing. Just that added displacement, you pair that with uh, Johanna, and you get the Condemn, Pull someone into the yoink range for my ev. I, I see why you'd want to ban that out. Malfurion pick is going to be snapped up once again. Thrall showing up for the first time in this series. Solid solo laner. Uh, but they could even potentially pivot into some kind of, you know, crazy crash lightning shenanigans, Kyle. <laughs> it is Volskaya, and while I don't suggest <laughs> it, this is the map to do it. Boeing pulling out the Nazebo. So good on this map, in my opinion. Malfail to deal with that soak as well. I really like Boeing's draft. It's a bit different. The Malthale and Gul'dan does cause a bit of problems because it leaves White Mane to, you know, do I heal Malthale? Do I heal the Gul'dan? It, it puts her in a kind of scary position within team fights. But if utilized correctly, oh, Boeing is terrifying. I was going to say a Raynor or a Phoenix would round off Cerna's draft so very well. And both of these drafts are actually so good. I like this game number three. I think you need that pointed single target damage of Raynor over Phoenix in this instance, just because. You're not only dealing with Garrosh, who has the armor trait, but also white main. Garrosh is going to be very hard to take down. I'm personally yeah. glad that that's not Ginger Dread in his Evo. I would have been fine with that Kala if I was given a warning. But thankfully, I, I don't need a warning. So good, good, good on you, Bo. Didn't you make Ginger Dread cookies? I, you know, I saw that. Don't even a, try to back away from it. I saw it. We're out here trying to grow as people. Kyler. you know <laughs> and I, I had to face my fears i i gave myself a warning and said i'm gonna try to make this ginger drain as evil and i'm i'm proud to say that my rendition was actually flawless i mean it was really good i i posted a picture of ginger drain as evil in my cookie and, and it looked the same it looked the same i agree <laughs> with you but Without further ado, let's introduce our teams for game number three. On the left, in blue this time, is Cerner. It's Mayog on Thrall, Krovax on Johanna, Coldam on the Rainer, Sin playing Jaina, and Tulio on Malfurion. Over on the right side, we have Boeing. Right now, it's going to be This Is Me on Goldan. Archie's playing Nazebo, not Ginger Dread Nazebo. Thank you. Bless RNG. My is on White Mane. Twist X will be throwing people around and taunting with Garrosh. And Exact shifting from the Rexar over to the Angel of Death, Malthio. I'm so down with this Nazebo pick. I, We never get to see Nazebo. And now with the current XP changes, I think that he is so good across many maps. We'll see how Boeing... You know, end up playing with it, but we are absolutely seeing the Crash Lightning picked up here for the Thrall. So while that makes me sad inside, we're going to see some big damage numbers coming up from Aeon. I like these sprays getting dropped. There's a nice stun from the ground break. Warbreaker is the talent of choice at level 1 for Gara, so the more that gets stacked up, the better for the chances of Bone to take the lead in the series. Rotation up top. Right now, it looks to be Coldam's Rainer squaring off against Exact's Mouthfeel. I think this is a matchup that actually could work well for the Rainer, just to kind of play keep away, keep out the only check. And it is going to be Crash Lightning Color. Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah, it's scary to see, like I said, it can stack up so much damage during the late game, but it limits a bit of the survivability of Thrall. So far, we're only seeing one stack on that. We'll see if Thrall's able to get that one moving over the first objective, because of course, on this map, the objective puts pretty much all the heroes in one space, so Thrall's able to stack it pretty easily. That's why we see it more frequently on this map or something like BOE over others, but we'll see if he's able to make it work. So far over the course of this series, we've seen both teams pretty much mirror each other in terms of macro decision making. But this is the first time where we're seeing a break where Cerner decides to go for the fortification camp first. And it's almost like the sound of that being picked up was like made Boeing think, oh wait, oh, that's pretty good. We should probably get one of those ourselves. So then they rotate over afterwards. Does this number disparity lead to an advantage down the road? It looks like it. It looks like Cerner is going to go ahead and rotate up at the support camp while the fortification camp is getting picked up. They're getting ahead on the overall race, race with resources. Man, I don't understand what happened. Cerner was behind in game number one, six to eight seconds on each decision. And now this time, they're, last game they did better. This game, they're dictating the flow of the game as well. Cerner have really stepped it up um, since game number one. They quickly rotated to the support camp and picked that one up. Not only does that secure them an extra item for the first objective, but it also gives them a big boost in experience, which is fantastic for them. Uh, I love seeing what Cerner have done in these past two games. And they're definitely building up a head of steam. Uh, Boeing, they're gonna have to start to establish themselves early and often if they wanna try to dissuade that. With the garage pick, they can definitely force out some passive positioning because the moment Tulio's Malfurion steps too far into the plate, Sin gets involved, that's going to be a throw into the dumpster anytime that throw is available. But, if Cerner is able to keep this kind of momentum going, it could be very hard for uh, the fly boys and gal to uh, come away to victory at its best of five. So what if I told you it was 2018 and there was only one stack on Thrall? <laughs> I would say less than ideal, but that could very well turn around over the first objective phase. Twist X is going to eat some harassment and start to back away. 20%, not bad. Cerner missing a little bit of experience in the bottom side, but nothing too, too crazy. This is Thrall's time to shine. Wants to be able to stack up that Crash Lightning. Still only sitting at one stack. If Thrall isn't able to get to 10, 15 stacks on this first objective, it could be massively problematic because it gets to the point where you almost don't even have a level one talent i know i'm focusing a lot on this one but it is important there's the flip in on a johanna but johanna is so good against garrosh for that very reason you just use the iron skin and walk away it's a nice response you press the d key take the easy stroll out and it is a good point to bring up it's a gamble taking crash lightning if you don't own that full value out of it you're uh definitely behind a proverbial curve right now both teams don't really look to be going all in to try to make a play for the first triglov protector Understandably so. Go ahead and pick up another fortification camp on either side. Provac steps forward, eats the Warbreaker. There's the Iron Skin used early at the beginning. Not gonna be able to net too much, so now Twistex could look to step forward. Nicely, nicely done there by Sin to get the peel. Backline, in the front line, I like seeing that kind of dynamic. Really, really good too by Cerner to just back up and pick up another item for themselves. Again, experience and the item just to contest these team fights. Krovax walking in, Twist actually misses the toss onto the enemy hero and manages to use it onto a minion and that just t turns Boeing's tempo in this fight from something decent to absolutely nothing. Yeah, you gotta go back to the drawing board. They still have time. Percentage only 95%. Now they're gonna have to step on there and try to maintain presence. Row on the Johanna. Iron Skin is yes. available. Twist X eating the wrong end of that trade. Has to back away. White Man and Garage both allow him to sustain effectively forever. But look at that corruption damage going into the Johanna. Both teams at each other's throats. First protector, though, is gonna get picked up by Sir. Cerner step up with their extra items and find the first objective of the game. Great for them. Still low stacks, and I'm going to be continually talking about those because it is such an important variable in this game. Meanwhile, talking about stacks on the side of Boeing, we got 68 on that Voodoo Ritual, 15 on Pandemic as well for the Nazebo. So once those are um, getting a little bit higher, Nazebo, his power spikes start to come in, especially at that level 20 points, of course. Um, Meanwhile, just mid focus and top here for Cerner. Next objective is on the top side of the map. So it is important that Cerner use this um, trig lab to try to take out the top structures for Boeing so that they have more control over the second objective in the game. Top structure in particular, that top well, which is going to be taken down. That is a lot of sustain out the window for Boeing over the next protector. 
That's pretty much the name of the game anytime you ever come away with the first robot. But even so, Kyla, I have to give a lot of props to both of these teams. Anytime I see an objective phase happen where both teams have someone low on health, someone in auto attack or two away from dying, but the rotation of overall positioning allows both teams to get away unscathed without giving up that first blood, I know we're in a game that features high caliber play on both sides. You know the limits of your characters. You know how much you can try to contest before you have to back away. Props to both teams for being able to do exactly that. So far, this is me on the Gul'dan has faced very, very little pressure. You know, on the side of Cerner, what do they really have that can get on top of this Gul'dan? Perhaps a flank, maybe a Sunder, but aside from that, uh, it's it's difficult for Boeing's backline to gain access from Cerner. So I, I actually really do like this Gul'dan pick. A lot of the times we see Gul'dan into the likes of a Diablo or a Muradin where it just, it's a problem for Gul'dan because he gets dove so easily. So moving forward in this game, I really do see this Gul'dan starting to push out some huge numbers. I'm already seeing 14,000 heroic damage well above anyone else in the game. I, yeah, I mean, the, the highest is Rainer on the other side with only 7.2. So Gul'dan's presence, uh, this is me, waving high every time he presses, throws that corruption out. I do think that there is a window where Gul'dan can get rocked in like a one-shot scenario. We have Sundering picked up, Bless Shield, Standard, and Twilight Dream. Sundering into Bless Shield and Twilight Dream afterwards, that should be enough to set up a, a takedown um, if Jaina has Blizzard available and gets the full merits of their burst potential now. And we've seen Sin be able to do that a number of times where I do think the dynamic will shift some, somewhat. But if they don't pull that off, I see Cerner struggling a lot in these team fights just because of this raw output from This Is Me. My Rary has to be on point with that uh, cleanse at level 7 picked up for the white main. We'll see if she's able to you know, make that work for the team. And meanwhile, during this kind of downtime, downtime in between these objectives, both these teams just clearing waves. Looks like there's an engagement on top side, but really nice toss by Twist X to keep Exact alive. Not only is alive, but also has that oh. turret. And now the counter engage. The taunt just misses because the unstoppable frames of Kovacs, but in goes Boeing. Oh. Huge silence. I need you all to calm down, says Tulio. Steps forward, hits the big Twilight Dream, and we're like, we're coming away with first blood. Mouthfeel, Angel of Death on the receiving end of exactly that. Beautiful play by both sides. The garage throws, the taunt just missing though against the Iron Skin allowed Johanna to walk away. But the follow-up aggression, we saw Boeing try to get something out of that even after the taunt was unable to land. Comes back to bite them in the end, still. That was very nicely played by both sides. Boeing had, they were so close to making that work, but very clutch iron skin, um, just to stop the engagement from Boeing from happening. Nice job, Krovax, on that one. Now, moving forward, 13's here for Cerner. They're looking pretty. They've got a support camp at this point. They're already, and a um, turret. They're already controlling the point. Boeing are just trying to get to that level 13 point to look to contest this objective. They'll have that momentarily. They do pick that up now. The protector percentage is racking up to 50%, so the time is nigh. If they want to try to do something and get involved, there's a nice condemn. Oh. Three person stun, bless shield comes out. Blizzard gets used also, not gonna be able to set up any kind of kill pressure. Gargantuan walks forward. There's a support camp getting dropped. The stun on the cold am. Nice knockback. Twist X is definitely looking for the throw on Rainer. There's a throw into the horrify. Isolates Mayok, who throws out Ooh. the sundering. They're going in right now, Colin. Beautiful sundering, and now the members of Cerner oh. are pushing in further. Twist is so low, but so is Kovac. Oh. Barry ends up going down. Exact solo oh. twist. Does he die here as well? That is three down for Boeing. Objective going over to Cerner as well. Sin is starting to back in the bush. Has to be really, really careful. Nice turnaround by Cerner to pick up this objective and all of those kills. Really tight play by this team. Oh baby, a triple. That is going to be three heroes getting taken down on the side of Boeing. Paves the way for the second protector gets snapped up by Cerner, who are rocking and rolling at the moment. They make short work of that top fort. Catapult every third wave now. They're going to rotate down towards the mid lane, see if they can do the exact same. Archie, do everything you can. Get joined by This Is Me, who did complete the corruption stack, so that is going to be some damage, but not enough to stop this second fort from going down. Cerner as well. With or This Jaina build is much better this time compared to any other game we've seen so far. I really like the burst potential, especially against the Garrosh. Fantastic choices here, but uh -oh. there's the tossing. Crowbacks has the Iron Skin to walk away, but that's the last right, so not going to be able to walk for very long. 
But wait, there's more, says Malfield. That is going to be a per the first takedown for Boeing, and that's going to take some of the wind out of the sails and some of the starch out of that push. They use the remaining percentage of the protector just to securely disengage. Now we're seeing Boeing show some of the merits of their composition and their lethality. We've seen a lot of interplay between the taunt and the iron skin, or just iron skin in general against the garage. But you have to also consider now that that heroic from Malfiel, if you have a low health bar, yep. Malfiel isn't going to be able to do too much for you. He's more sustained healing. So for some of maybe the newer viewers in chat, Boeing's draft has so much power during the late stages of the game. Archie is stacking up something called Voodoo Ritual, and right now is sitting at 167 stacks at 11 minutes and 50 seconds, which is huge. Once that gets to 175 and level 20 hits for Boeing, the power of Nazebo skyrockets. So Boeing actually aren't very far behind at this point. Yes, Cerner has additional passive experience from top and mid and has that pressure, but once Boeing gets level 20, they're terrifying. Here's the here, hor horrify. There's a horrify going out. This support camp is gonna get claimed. Twilight Dream is actually going to get interrupted and that is oh. bad for business potentially, but you don't even need it. If you're gonna go ahead and get two heroes taken down, make that three, you cost yourself Malfurion in the process, but if I'm on the side of Cerner, I'm trading three heroes for my Malfurion every day of the week. I'm sorry. That evolved much quicker than I thought it was going to. Boeing, they're fighting against all odds at this point. You know, their opponents having that level 16 now is definitely a huge issue. And I agree, Cerner just trading out the three for one is a very, very good trade for Cerner. And of course, now they have, they end up picking up any, uh, no, they didn't actually. So that did go over to Boeing. No items here, which is basically the best thing going for Boeing at this point. Siege camp by Colum is going to get picked up also. If that's picked up at the right time, the next protector will be in the bottom portion of the map. And with that catapult showing up every now and again in the top lane to further aid that, that could be some passive value had if it goes without any sort of response. But right now, like you said earlier, Kyle, the only thing Boeing's really worried about right now is level 20. If they can get there potentially without losing a keep, that damage from Nazebo is going to be a problem and a half for Cerner. Malfurion is going to have a very tough time dealing with not only the Nazebo, but you pair that with a completed quest from Goldan with the Corruption, you're going to see some green health bars vanishing yep. before your eyes. It's going to be tough. We'll see, uh, we'll see if Boeing can just hang on until that point. This is the third objective of the game. Going to be bottom side, so at least Boeing have a little bit of structure to back up to. This 50% health fort. They're picking up their fortification camp. Meanwhile, on the other side, Cerner also picking theirs up. Only 15 stacks on the Crash Lightning. Um, so that's an issue already at 192 stacks for the Nazebo. So once level 20 hits, Boeing, they're terrifying. Terrifying is a very good word for it. And they have Horrify on top of that for the Sinning. Haha. -ha. Next objective phase is going to be up. Exact already ate a decent amount of chip damage. White Mane will be there to patch that up. Right now, Mayog is only up to 15 stacks of Crash Lightning. So I'm starting to feel like that Gambit may not be paying off for the team in blue. Who opens this first volley across the bow? Corruption stacks go out. Does some damage to Coldan and puts him down near to half health. Does the exact commit? A lot of damage goes in. Have you seen Garrosh? Armor or not, Lotar oh gone. He is this he gets blown up immediately. <laughs> I love you so much, man. Holy cow. Instantly blown up is the Garrosh, and Boeing have to back up at this point. Top pressure is there, mid pressure is there as well. Boeing just need to cut the bleeding. They have this Gul'dan and the Zeebo. They can very easily defend this objective, but instead they miss all of this mid wave, all of these two top waves. Boeing just, I, I don't know why they're sitting down bottom in a 4v5. They're not going to win this. Yeah, there, there is no way. You can, you can do everything you want, but you go in without your front line in this instance. You already saw what happened to... Like, Garrus got blown up before Scarlet Aegis was even pressed. Like, yeah. <laughs> if that doesn't say burst, I don't know what does. They do rotate Nazebo up top to clear that out. But uh, some of the damage is already effectively done. Bottom four is going to get claimed. The condition of making it to 20 while keeping a keep looks to be uh, a lofty ambition at best right now for Boeing. As Cerner is barreling down, making short work of this bottom keep wall. Zebo now rotating down, but I think this is just too little too late. Too slow to mid, too slow to top, and now bottom is just getting decimated by Cerner. This keep is at 50% health, but so is the Triglav. 
There goes the Gargantuan as well to just assist in this defense, but immediately blown up now. And Cerner are moving back in 19 and a half. Do Boeing have the ability to force a fight? It looks like they're starting. And it looks like they're not trying to save this protector at all. They're gonna go ahead and go for the keep in the clap on Garrosh's face. That is going to be an oof in the chat for real. This is me starts to back away, gets harassed by the water elemental who shifts fire over to Malthio who vanishes off the map. Also, there's a root, forces out the stasis. The root afterwards is gonna connect Twilight Dream. Brrr, that is going to be an Azebo blown up with level 20 picked up. Bottom key, three heroes down also. And they're looking to go for the entire ace. Right now, Cerner, they're looking to go up in his best of five. Cerner have a lot of core damage. It's just white mean and gold dan left for boeing but that is certainly not going to be enough and if that's so unfortunate boeing had so much late game potential but they just weren't able to stop the bleeding mid and top end up dying in this engagement on bottom and that's going to be it that burst damage i didn't yeah. expect it you know <laughs> garros didn't expect it that looked like it hurt that looked like it really hurt. Loktar, oh god. Where do you come up with this crap, man? You're a legend. Jeez. I mean, 44,000 hero damage from Thrall. Wasn't able to stack up the Crash Lightning. Proves to not be so much a problem at all. Goldan, 61,000 hero damage. Nazebo, only 30. You know that they were looking to get the level 20 to change that around. But... That early, that, that mid to late game burst came online the hard way for Cerner. He managed to go up 2-1 in this best of five. Well deserved too. They've really changed the pace of their play style. Also drafting more along the lines of what's strong for the map, um, mm -hmm. which I absolutely love. I, you know, Cerner have just really stepped it up in games number two and three, which has put them at a winning position here in this grand finals for the ahgl and that's super exciting i have to give a lot of respect though um to to boeing for that composition because what they were yeah. trying to do was apparent right get the oh, level yeah. 20 get get nazebo all the way stacked up like you said they did that at what 11 minutes they were hard yeah. committed to that if they did manage to make it to level 20 i just don't see a world where malfurion would be able to deal with that kind of damage that would have been yeah. an avalanche Every, every time. The moment you see Gara or Goldan and Zebo on the screen, suddenly half your health bar is immediately gone. Um, so if they did make it to that, they would have been able to steamroll the late game. And what that says to me is they're a team that they're, they're trying to put fate in their own hands. They're not like, you know, playing to not lose. They want to take compositions that play to their strengths. And I think they need to keep that kind of confidence if they do want to rally back and force out game number five. They've shown themselves to be a team that's capable of doing exactly that. So we're jumping into the next lobby now. I really want to see if they continue to go for the proverbial gusto or if we will see Cerner come away our grand finals champions here for AHTL Fall 2018. I'm really hoping we do get a game number five. That would be the dream. You know what, to be I honest really though? Would. You know what, to be, Kyle? Bing. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Bing. Perfect. Jumping Excellent. into the lobby right meow. Looks like they're staying with Cerner on the left. So let me go ahead. I think because I'm good at this and I know what I'm doing. Two there for the match. It's going to be two there. All right, we're good. Again, $4,500 in charity prizing on the line. The victors uh, will be able to give that to a charity of their choosing. On the left side, we'll have Cerner, who is playing for the First Hand Foundation. On the right, Boeing, Flying One Colors. They are playing for Child's Play, uh, who have a network of over 100 hospitals worldwide. With the help of the hospital staff, they set up gift wishes Full of video games, toys, books, and other cool things for the kids. Uh, great causes on both sides. Um, not only do they win, but so do we, because this best of five has uh, been a lot of fun. I agree. You know, sometimes um, casters like you and I are used to casting like top, top level HGC or open division or what have you. Mm -hmm. And when when you go from casting that to, to 
casting games that aren't HGC level, sometimes it can be a little bit harder because you see things that happen and it's like, oh, that shouldn't happen or, or you know, just like wild plays. Um, but like, I swear lately, it's just the level of play in any really organized environment has just, it seemed to have stepped up. When I was casting the um, those EU games with Quacknicks the other day, like those teams are playing really, really well. So it's fantastic to see. And these two teams as, as well, like it's very obvious why they are in the grand finals because they're, they're playing tight games. They are. I, I really empathize with that because I, I started casting doing chair league, which was the, the yeah. definition of community effort. Just, you know, we we're having fun. We just show up once a week. We play in the games. But over the course of time, um, the way has definitely been paved to see higher level play at, at all levels of competition. And uh, we're seeing it right now. I mean, we, we, we see these teams going for camps at the right time. We see them establishing macro pressure. We see them understanding, like you like you said, like the win condition. Like, oh, we have Garas's throw available. We don't. All right, let's back up. That sort of thing. Um, it's really cool to see this level of play uh, in the H A H G L. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Did you see what just happened in lobby? <laughs> No, wow. okay. I'll be back in two seconds. I'll be back in two seconds. All right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, so potential last game of the afternoon, mm -hmm. which is sad, but it is on Sky Temple. We've seen some pretty crazy series historically um, have intense games on Sky Temple. This is another one of those maps where globals are just so darn powerful. I would expect a Haka or perhaps even an Abathur to be utilized on this map. I wonder if either of these teams play Abathur. That's the big question. I know that put a smile on your face. Kyle, you know, I still have yet to play Abathur. That's so dumb, dude. <laughs> I'm so sad right now. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry. So, one day. One... You know, you, you did watch Die Hard for me. I, I gotta, we, we gotta do that stream. We gotta do that stream. That is true. I completely forgot about that. I held up my end of the bargain. Oh, but, oh, wait, oh, I'm not saying hello. Hello. <laughs> I'll flame you in front of the whole family. There we go. Garrosh being banned off. <sighs> What's the next one going to be? Cerner. Taking their time. That's an important game. It's the I, Kerrigan. We're, we're going to see the commitment to the Kerrigan man. You know, a, as much priority has been placed on this Kerrigan man, I, I kind of want to see it. I want to see what, <laughs> what the fuss is about. I, I mean, I know the players don't feel like getting wrecked by a Kerrigan, but I, I just like, oh, that's why they've been banning Kerrigan the entire time. The Diablo yes. ban, uh, pairing with the Garrosh ban, we, we've seen, seen what Garrosh can do. We've seen him also get wiped off the dry erase board, um, but he's banned this time. The horde. Johanna, first pick. That's interesting. Uh, <laughs> it it. It worked pretty darn well last game, but uh, first pick is always a curious one. It's jo Johanna's in, in that weird place, in my opinion, where like her value is almost always apparent. But is it, but it's just more utilitarian. It's not, we need her right out of the gate, un unless that's just where the hero pool is at or just where the overall prioritization is. Johanna is a character that fits into a range of compositions, not the most aggressive, but if you're gonna round it out with a white main and Jaina, what you've afforded yourself is a near, nearly unkillable front line with pretty solid setup for a blizzard. So I do get it. So I love the fact that we see a Dahaka coming in relatively early here. Cause again, on this map and this patch, Dahaka is golden. I love this second pick Dahaka. Um, I think it's gonna be super powerful. Cassia banned off as well. What do Boeing decide to ban with this Maiev and Dahaka looking around? It might be the choice on a tank, but it's gonna be the Kael'thas instead. That's an interesting one. I mean, we, we, we've seen what Kael'thas is able to bring to the table. On Sky Temple, there are some potentially narrow corridors. If you're fighting over the boss, something like that, um, especially over the bottom temple phase, you, you're walking through that bush, flame strike wakes you up, chain bomb spread around for free. I get it. Uh, we are gonna see a new brat, Goldan, snapped up. Goldan stolen away from the likes of Boeing. Uh, the corruption damage could be real for Cerner now. 
Yanub coming back once again. We'll see what this next pickup here for Boeing is going to be. You got the Jaina. They need some consistent damage here for the Anub Iraq. Uh, we saw, you know, a good Raynor last game by Cerner. We'll see what Boeing decided to run with this time. It's going to actually be the Lunara Yrel. That's something that I haven't seen in a little bit. Um, well, I guess casting the other day, but um, do you remember when Yrel was just every single game first pick or ver ban? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the, the character's name may as well have been Whoopi. Like... <laughs> He kind of defined your real to me. Anytime I see a style your real, I'm like, we'll be, we'll be gives his regards. Mm -hmm. Um, Malfurion will round things out, but you know, you know what we never got, Kyle? We never got the heels and the shields. <laughs> Anna and Mediv together. True. Forever. For how long? Yeah, forever. <laughs> That's true. We I almost said we also didn't get an HGC. Ah, whatever. It doesn't matter. Let's, uh, F. um, yeah, there we go. Sky Temple, ladies and gentlemen, potential last game. We'll see if Cerna can close it out. Boeing, I, I like what they got, you know, bringing back that, uh, the Lunara and mm. Jaina. They got the burst damage. They got the slow methodical damage. And of course, a lot of PVE potential coming through from that Lunara. So we'll see what ends up happening. Game number four, like you said, potentially the last of this best of five on the left. Looking to close it out, it will be Cerner. It's going to be Mayog on Maev. See Krovax playing Anubarak. Coldam's on Dahaka. Sin is playing Goldan and Tuli O. Back again, looking to silence the crowd with the Malfurion. On the right, in red, is Boeing. This is me on Jaina. Archie on Lunara. Ek playing the Johanna. Uh, Myreri on white main and exact playing the URL and look at that. What a beautiful Christmas miracle. Archie says my niece was born 10 minutes ago. That's wonderful. Babies everybody, are cool, dude. Everybody give, say congratulations to Archie in the chat, please. That's Whoa, exciting. Easy, easy clap. That was That's a clapper's bud. That was a clapper's bud. <laughs> Never change, Kyle. Never change. Here we go, baby. A little bit of a mid skirmish. Urel represented top, so Boeing definitely gonna want to walk away from this 4v5. Uh, just focus on the wave instead. You don't want to duel at a numbers disadvantage this early. Meanwhile, Dahaka already up into that top lane, and Cerner just they're quick. You know, this is a different Cerner. Mm-hmm. They they're playing. They have their eyes on the prize. They're one game away from netting four forty five hundred dollars in prizing for charity. Uh, they're definitely playing like they want to close it out right here on the micro level One thing I want to see is the interplay between the Jaina and a new that 40 armor is going to be the difference between a new Being a threat on the front line or being nuked at the very beginning of a team fight So if the blizzard gets held patiently around that Once that 40 armor goes away a much more juicy target than you only have Malfurion to back you up Absolutely agree. Ek taking some damage, but just stepping up onto this wave. Meanwhile, Boeing also picking up their siege camp. So this battle is going to be control over bottom. I like the fact that this is me. It's just immediately onto that mid wave, clearing that out to force a member of Cerner up into this mid. Mayog, we see making that rotation. Jaina, very low on mana, but uh, should provide some value in this bottom side. Mayog jumped up, caught soak before it went away making sure both teams stay even on experience soaking is very important these days uh cold Am with the dahaka could be a uh interesting bit of global presence to to catch that added soak to you know push in a siege camp before rotating over towards joining a fight you've seen some impactful drags uh very in various instances especially on infernal shrines wouldn't be surprised to see that become an element again but right now, we see Boeing again committing to this hard four-person rotation. We saw them do pretty well with that early on. No bruiser camp being started by Boeing during the early stage. Looks like Archie and This Is Me going to go start it off right now. A nice job by Cerner just to hang on to their bruiser camp. They spent some time clearing it out, uh, but it's just available for capping right away. It does look like both teams will get this running out for the early um, objective here. Temple starting in just the next 15 seconds. And this could be huge, depending on which team decide to push with their camp top side. And it looks like Cerner are already just four person stacked top with their global and bottom. This is a problem for Boeing because they have two down bottom, one of which is their support. This is such a good play here right now by Cerner. We saw earlier yeah. on Infernal Shrines, they didn't net this kind of value. 
with the Dahaka earlier where they had him in the top lane as the objective was also up in the top lane but having this forces out a response exact has to stay down here and they need to try to get the interrupt on a potential burrow once Colnam shows up first set of temples are here top of the conversation looks to be in the top portion of the map Julio eating what shots that they can Kanem is going to bring Krovax and his Bruiser camp up towards the fold to help my area and this is me clear that out but right now, it's actually going to be Yorel rotating and leaving Dahaka down there. And with a slight experience, leave for Boeing as a result. Wow. Meanwhile, mid, again, just being captured here by Boeing. Dahaka just trying to get as much value as possible in the bottom side. Here comes the Brush Stalker to try to join the fight here. Actually just going mid to just continue to clear, which is, it's a good choice. Just getting mid pushed out, getting bottom pushed out just constantly with this global is definitely how you want to be playing this early stage. Maybe if Cerner were able to step up and try to force a fight, that Brush Stalker could have been used to join. But uh, instead, just focusing on the soak is definitely the choice. And yeah. Boeing coming up a little bit ahead off of that trade. You know, the experience isn't huge, so it's not really worth talking about, but still just a tiny bit. It's definitely of note. They, they've done a great job of weathering the storm, and not only that, but they managed to hang on to this top fort. Catapult every third minion wave definitely has an impact going into the mid game these days. So denying that macro pressure uh, is definitely a feather in the old cap for Boeing. The middle fort is also pretty low, so... Uh, they managed to deal with this global pressure amazingly well. Take C. Krovax, Sin, and we have two other members from Cerner looking to move in to deal with the Siege camp. Can they get an advantage here? See, Cerner are pushing up right now. Looking at Dahaka, has Brush Stalker in six seconds, so able to make that a five before on the bottom side. He's looking to do that, but probably not wanting to spend that one just yet meanwhile mid x is just looking to create some pressure there to force at least one member of cerner into this mid lane we'll see if they decide to to rotate up but right now cerner are doing an excellent job at pushing up picking up these structures because any structure that you pick up means that the objective can focus on something else meanwhile here comes the engage this is me down really low at this point my Rayri is so low as well but the oh. jaina damage Lauren. white main by the way haha -ha. that's actually going to be two heroes getting taken down on the side of sir cerner my area is going to go ahead and hang on nicely done by them that is the Top 10 anime betrayal that Cerner was not looking to have happen. They were trying to press forward, get a potential takedown, get that bottom well, to deny to sustain. But again, that white main support is just Huge. unreal right now. Two kills off the off the basically re-engage of that fight. Midwave was pushed up too, which secured a fort for Boeing. That's going to be Katas. That's going to be consistent XP. And then they just get control over the bottom side of this map. Level 10s here. Cerner are in trouble. Like, they had the opportunity to use their Dahaka during this next objective to really gain a lot of value. That's where your global really comes into power is on the second objective of this game. But they're not going to be able to do much of anything with it. The experience lead is definitely starting to further balloon in favor of Boeing as a result of that two takedown swing. They're going to go ahead and get the lion's share, if not the entirety, of this bottom temple as a result. That should be the bottom fort afterwards. The middle fort was taken down earlier also. Those two takedowns have definitely dictated the terms of this mid game. Level 10s now here for Cerner. You got that Horrify. You got Cocoon as well as the Warden's Cage here to make some big plays. And of course, that Twilight Dream has been monumental in teamfights during this series. So we'll see if the Malfurion pickup is going to be able to make some big plays. King's Cage, I want to see what kind of value that Bouncy Castle is going to be able to knit. Four-person rotation. Keeping an eye on the boss just to make sure no cheeky shenanigans are at play. But they're going to rotate down, go through this minion wave. If the rotation isn't in, it looks like it will be, especially after that bruiser camp was picked up. Right now, Cerner just kind of posed the idea that they were going to push down bottom, and that enough was enough to warrant a response. Three people rotated down bottom in anticipation. That's good. This means that Cerner, um, it's good for Cerner at least. That means that they're going to be up one camp. Actually, it'll be even trading bruises for Siege. So both will have their camps up, but Cerner have their Dahaka to deal with the bottom side that Boeing, um, the bottom side pressure that Boeing will create with the Siege camp and those catapults pushing in. So it is quite even at this point, but Cerner aren't able to really force any team fights. Probax is caught here, has the unstoppable frames on the burrow, but. Cerner would have liked to try to force something before Boeing get level 13, but it doesn't look like they're going to be able to do it. 
I like that Boeing kind of went fishing to see if someone was on the siege camp or were rotating in there. They already had the wisp from Lunara uh, to check on that. Thank thankfully, they decided not to go for that boss. I feel like that would have been too cheeky and ambition. At the very least, you want to get to level 13 before you really consider that. Um, just keep Cerner in a place where they have to try to wait for the next opportunity rather than you potentially giving them one. Provax comes out of the bush, says surprise, misses the impale. Siege camp should get poked down here pretty handily by the likes of Lunar and Jana. It is able to do that. With the temple at the top and bottom portion of the map, yeah. we again see ourselves in a position where Tahaka could potentially burrow in, get value Ow. off of the global presence. Urel forced to use Ardent Defender just to Ooh. try to stop the advance here of Dahaka. Huge plays so far from Cerner on the top side here to push in that camp. Coldam doing a really nice job at basically making Urel completely worthless in this situation. Gonna be able to get level 13, and now Urel's just not available. So Dahaka can just sit on top and then look to channel a burrow down bottom. Uh, Cerner, though, I would like to see them make some sort of uh, play here, and they are. They're sitting on the point. This means that Boeing, they're forced to fight in, and then Cerner have that dig. Cerner made a fantastic macro decision here. They have level 13. They need to try to take this fight right now. Iron skin already used. Heck. Knocked down to about half health. There's the Warden Cage. There's the Twilight Dream. Let's press our R keys. Let's see what happens. The bounce back on Myeri sends White Man back to base. Crowback's trying to get back. And the Leaping Strike. Lunara says, I can chuckle too, actually. That's going to be two for one so far. Tulio gets blown up. Ek tries to step in. Gets the root sin. Get pays for sins. That is going to be four for one right now. Owing, they're looking pretty good. I'm really confused as to why Dahaka didn't dig in with that. Uh, because Yorel was showing mid, Cerner got the biggest engagement of their careers, and there was no dig. It, as soon as as soon as White Mane basically fell in that situation, they could have dug in or during that Warden's Cage and looked to just turn that into a massive team wipe. Yes, you lose some value on that top point because it was free, but that's the whole point of contesting bottom. That's the whole point. You have the dig so that you can make it a 5v4, but Cerner weren't able to find that, and Boeing turned that around and just absolutely destroy Cerner. That decision to not send the Haka down there could very well come back to bite them and could be the beginning of the discussion for game number five. It looks like Boeing are not going to be content to just let this boss go down and be cleared out for free. They will try to see if they can catch someone out of position. They will try to see if they can get another takedown to potentially come away with the first keep of the game. Johanna, however, is in the top lane. So right now, it looks just to be kind of a, a feint, a parry of sorts, just to say we're, we're positioning down here. But really all we're trying to do is keep you tied up so we can get our level 16 advantage. And the 6 to 1 kills are proving to be an issue as well for Cerner. The experience advantage for Boeing is substantial. Krovax walking into the jungle oh. without any vision. Hi. Here comes the engage, Lauren. Jumps over the wall. There's the condemn afterwards. They're going to go ahead and further commit. Throws out the blessed shield. Captain America impersonation. Krovax half help. Way forward. Twilight Dream comes out. Warden Tate goes in. Sin is going to eat a lot of damage. Has to back away. Archie jumps in on the back line. Tries to take out Goldan. Unsuccessfully so. Ultimately, they will be able to get him afterwards. Domino starts to fall on the blue side cerner on the ropes there's the backflip into the dumpster and that's a full two quote trixler a five man team wipe that is unfortunate indeed when you walk into the jungle when all enemy members are missing and you're down a talent tier that's basically the best that you can hope for is getting five person team wipe we'll see if cerner can hang on to this game but this is a tough one. You're down two levels. You're down basically every structure. Johanna already on bottom, starting this channel. The whole map is opened up at this point. Cerner are in trouble. The one rotation that could very well define this entire series, Kala, is venturing into that siege camp without your level 16 talent and being mm -hmm. uncertain of where your enemy team is. That's a monka shake in the chat every day of the week. <laughs> Came back to him. It's going to cost him. 11 I'm take sweating. that as the one. And I like the way that Archie played that fight too. You know, being able to dive onto that back line. We talked last game about basically no members being able to really pressure onto the, the Gul'dan super easily. And Sin was up so far in that fight. It just made it very easy for basically any members of Boeing to step in and deal damage to the Gul'dan. Um, so I, I like the, you know, the leaping strikes on the backside, leaping back in as well. So just really nice plays by the damage dealers of Boeing. Yeah, Xzac jumped over that wall as Yorel and was like, allow me to reintroduce myself. 
That is going to be a pretty easy team fight. Be able to get that kind of positioning. Goldland's gonna have to play further back or else those sins will come at a cost every time. See the rotation up. Wiss is gonna spot Sin leading the charge on Goldan. So perhaps the lesson hasn't exactly been learned, but a new brack is nearby. Daka down towards bottom, clearing out the siege camp, just trying to mine those proverbial fences. Catapults are gonna be a problem though for yep. the rest of the game. Here we go. Cerner need to just force a fight. Boeing are already on their way to level 20. Dig coming through at this point, but it just... No, they, mm -mm. they need to time the dig with like a cocoon to try to force a fight somewhere. But that was just such a problem. I like that Cerner at least looked like they wanted to force a fight. But now Boeing just, they all rotated mid and they're just going to clear out waves, use the vision from the Wisp to just stay away from Cerner, get that level 20 and just take the game over. Cerner needed to find a fast fight, but that wasn't it. Boeing is in a position right now where they have so much more to lose than to gain by going into any sort of engagement. Every camp is picked up and accounted for. They are so close to level 20. They have no reason to deal with a blue health bar at all. So if Cerner is going to try to force a fight, they have to do something crazy and aggressive. Either force out a response or to just catch someone egregiously out of position. But Boeing looked to be pretty allergic to doing all that right now. Two temples, top and middle in 20 seconds. Level 20 should be there around the same time. Things are starting to look kind of grim for Cerner. 20s are so close. Cerner have almost zero window at this point with this midway being cleaned up. That window is gone. Cerner down a keep, down basically all map control, need to win a fight against Storm tier talents. And that is <laughs> very difficult to Lauren. It's, it's a tall order to the heights of J-How for sure. Temple in the mid lane is going to get picked up right now for Boeing, who are enjoying that storm tier talent advantage. Some shots are being picked up in the top lane. You got to do what you can right now if you are Cerner. Exact steps forward. Doesn't really mind things too much. Does have Arn Defender that would buy him enough time for the rest of the team to show up. But right now, this playing to not lose strategy, sooner or later, I understand. Cerner, you're two levels away from level 20, but you got to try to fight right now, I think. Speaking of that, Coldam is the one getting engaged on here by Boeing. Meanwhile, Mayog trying to find the angles onto the back line. Ooh. Dig in, does find Krovax. He's trying to just stop anything from Boeing, but a huge Twilight Dream as well. Krovax taking a lot of damage. There goes the Ardent Defender, and Boeing are taking control of this fight. It looks like we are going to be seeing game number five after all. There's the Horrify. Maev is going to get taken down. Four heroes leaving just a lone sin to mount up and back away. It looks like we will see game number five as Archie leads the charge. Congratulations to your new niece. That's going to be the good luck charm for game number four. We are that about really to be is. all tied up. Wholesome chat. I, I, uh, here we go. Boeing, <laughs> Boeing pushing in. They've got everything on their side. You know, they... You know, they had eight different ways to end the game. They're choosing my favorite one. Just run at the court. Ek just stepping up. She's styling there on Sin. You know, switching in Ek for this game looked really, really powerful. She's absolutely bodying. Cerner was just in a near impossible situation right there. Level 18 to level 20, the, the writing's on the wall. You have to try to fight. You have to try to take that game. But you're in a position where that's just not going to happen. The positioning there was proper from the rest of Boeing. The squishier parts of the, the lineup hanging out in the back line. So your targets are either a Johanna who has indestructible at level 20 or a Urel that has Arden Defender. It, the yeah. idea that you're going to be able to nuke anyone in that instance just it just wasn't on a table. The cocoon was there on the white main, but it was just too, too thick, too thick. My... My main concern, again, was like Cerner had a galaxy brain play. They did. They had so much pressure in the top lane. Um, Coldam, I believe it was, on the Dahaka, pressured out the URL so hard. Ardent Defender got used. They had an opportunity to force a 5v4 after they had... It basically would have been a 5v3 at that point. Mm -hmm. Control bottom, maybe pick up the boss off of that. But Cerner, they didn't use the Brush Stalker into the bottom side of the map and ended up all dying because of it. Stuff like that can't happen. This is game number five now. Stakes are high. A lot of money towards charity, and, which both of these teams desperately want to win. Um, I want to see tighter play from Cerner. We've seen them make huge plays and then just fall flat in those situations. And Boeing, they did an excellent job to capitalize on the fact that Dehaka was still top lane and, and they found so much value off that team fight. Nice job by Boeing to see that, uh, that hole in the armor of Cerner.
I think it just comes off of just the disparity in survivability on the front line. A new Barak being backed up only by Malfurion is just not going to be the same presence that a Johanna with a Urel and White Mane. It, it, it's just not. Um, it was 25,000 healing to 36 from White Mane. Uh, that number alone is going to make it tough for a new Barak to survive and do too much. But uh, the Arden Defender, past level 20, the Indestructible, they, they're just was no real opportunity for Goldan and my have to get anything close to a kill blow there. So I'm not surprised to see 15 to one, but gotta say, man, I'm glad we're getting game five. I'm glad we're getting game five. Me too. So we get to cast more games together. Chat gets to have a fun time hanging out, um, enjoying the wonderful games. And then of course, it's just the competition of a game five is always exciting. Maybe these teams have crazy drafts that they they've got lined up maybe they're they're gonna pull out the juice pirates or Ooh. something with uh you know lost vikings or something like that that could be fun it all comes down to this mm -hmm. uh best of five it's it's run the full length let me go ahead and update the scores two to two winner take all once we get into this next lobby uh gonna be it man Mm -hmm. I don't think we could ask for a better a better finals to round out the fall 2018 after hours gaming league uh, finals. Both these teams have shown up and put up one heck of a show uh, for us to cast and for for you guys and the audience to enjoy. So no matter how it plays out, um, a big thank you to both of the teams and to you guys for showing up. Uh, Charity wins out at the end of the day. So do mm -hmm. we for for having a really cool series to watch. Um, thanks true thanks everyone for showing up it means a lot you know you guys could be doing anything right now but you're spending your time here with us <laughs> supporting these awesome teams and yeah now more than ever it's very very important for this community to band together and uh support stuff like this so thanks it means a lot i think uh you you, you give it a taking a couple minutes break yeah, let's take a let's take a quick break. Welcome back, everyone, to the After Hours Gaming League Fall 2018 Grand Finals. We're here at game number five. My name is Lauren. It's my pleasure to be here once again with yeah, the Fox of Hots, Kitchen of Heroes, Community Coach, Neighborhood Friendly Kalamak. We are here, game number five. Cerner, Boeing. We are ready here in the lobby. We are set to go. Looks like we got uh, another change up. Yeah, they switched sides. I already took care of it because I'm good at this, Kyla. And I know what I'm doing. Got to change mine. There we go. <laughs> Excellent. These guys are being cheeky, switching up, keeping Excellent. us on our toes. But it's okay. They're giving us great games, so they're basically allowed to do what they want. Mm -hmm. Big thank you to you guys. Uh, yeah. First place, $4,500 going to charity. Looks like everyone's ready. Darn it. And we're what? on Dragonshire. That's exciting. Good one to close out this series. Heavy macro map, uh, despite being one of the smaller maps. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm, maybe Kerrigan makes it through on this map this time. I doubt it, though. This it's been bad every single game. In a world. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Nah, there we go. First band, mm -hmm. as if they mm -hmm. heard me somehow. Mm -hmm. Here's a big old F, but that's okay. I'll never forget Tempo Storm, Dragonshire, Kerrigan, Kerrigan Comp, yeah. where Malfurion was a ranged assassin. Yep. <laughs> Everyone else went full am YOLO. Good times, good times. Those were fun compositions, man. Mm -hmm. She just absolutely dominated the Malfurion Uther combo. It's a, it was so fun. It was really interesting being able to kind of break the game that way. Octalysis did it a bunch as well, running their solo tank Zool comps. That sort of stuff is just so cool. That's what makes Hoth so awesome. You know, you don't have to stick with the standard style like other games, you know, where you have your regular top laners, regular bot laners, regular junglers, all that jazz. This game's got the Abathers, it's got the Asmanans, it's got the Dahakas. Like, you can do so much cool stuff. It's got the Kala. That's my rant. Thanks, man. It's got you. It's got, it's got me. <laughs> Let the Inquisition Look at this meta. This Jaina white main meta. I mean, this is the first time we're not seeing a, a first pick warrior, to my knowledge, if in my recollection. I, I may be wrong grass. there. But the Johanna white main, I mean, 
we were like, oh, you know, the early prioritization on Johanna, that's interesting, but the Yorel Johanna tandem, oh, look at that beauty, that handsome boy himself, Malganis coming through in game number five, Malganis, while he's seen some nerfs, I still think he's super powerful and combined with the Jaina and the Maiev, I love this opener so far from Cerner. That's going to be a scary rotation. Look at, look at him out here with the blue steel face. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so <laughs> handsome. How does he do it? How are they going to learn to read if they can't even fit in a building? Well, again, okay. it's a... So the Rexar ban, I think, is justified on this map. When we saw Rexar earlier on Infernal Shrines, not really his map. Rexar can operate well on this map as well as Braxis Holdout, just because the single point control, he's so strong in that situation. He's not about the rotation, really. He's not about trying to double soak. He's about controlling that one area. So I like the fact that this was actually banned out. Ever trust a big button to smile? That girl is poison. It's been a while since I've actually said that, Kyle. I'm sitting here thinking about it. Lunara Golden, that's going to be uh, some green tinted health bars more often than not. Going to be real curious to see if we do see the Mal the Malfurion commitment uh, persist going into the final game of this best of five series. Going to be a lot of tick damage to deal with if that's the case. Haka Taronda. Oh, I was going to mention Taronda, and I can't believe we haven't seen her so far. Not picked nor banned. And I think that was the perfect pick for Cerner to round off their draft. The Taronda and Malganis synergy, even with the Maiev, like if you can time those lunar uh flares with Maiev pull-ins, like it can be devastating. And Malganis, of course, gives hit confirm for the Taronda as well with his knockup. Boeing rounding off their draft with that URL on the top lane. Um so far I haven't seen a lot of value out of the url pick we'll see if it uh, ends up working out here yeah the, the most value we've seen out of url is just being hard if not impossible to kill which i, yeah. I do think helped pave the way for a game number five but as far as establishing any sort of dominance she's just kind of been there um the, the haka pick again offers the opportunity to net global value but we we actually haven't really seen that come online in a lot of ways as far as you know an impactful burrow just like shaking up the game i do think that the malganis change from anubarak um is going to be big for cerner the the anubarak play has been strong but just when they've had malfurion to back it up it's just kind of like it, it, it's it's hard to, to stick around but this is it man it comes down to this game Absolutely number true. five uh, you want to you want to get okay i'll do it thank you i would love to ladies and gentlemen game five this is it on the left in blue is boeing this is me on goldan archie on lunara ek playing johanna exact on urel and white main is being played by my rary on the right give it up for cerner it's gonna be mayog on my f c Crovax is playing malganis cold lambs on dahaka once again sin will be looking to put people on ice for jana and tulio switching over to the taronda somebody's gonna be a wizard with these apples time to feed the level one of choice here for malganis i love that name <laughs> it's definitely a, a a meta name Works on a number of levels. Yeah. I also love the uh, animation for it. You got the little vampire teeth on enemy heroes whenever you can, uh, I guess, feed on them. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. So far, Cerner setting up in this rotation, just doing a, an excellent job stopping the members of Boeing from rotating through and just quickly picking up globes here for Sin on that Jaina. The sleep the into double the Dreadlord. Double Dreadlord. Yeah, uh, sneak into the Yoink. The sleep into the Yoink could be something to worry about if you're on the side of Boeing. Uh, I think if we see C. Krovax get real cheeky with some of these flanks and, and gets to sleep immediately onto the likes of a white main, a team fight could effectively be over before it even begins. I do think that Cerner have given themselves tools to win team fights. They just need to execute on that and uh, get value out of these hero selections. All right, both of these teams just starting up their siege camps. So nothing wild here. The big question mark for me is Cerner's Dahaka. Does Coldam rip that brush stock into the bottom lane at some point sooner rather than later to try to increase the team fighting pressure of Cerner on the bottom side or to just control the point? We'll have to find out. But I do want to see some aggressive brush stocks this game because that's the whole point of having that global, you know? 
I gotta agree. I think we're at the point right now, Kyle, to where if they don't do that, they stand to lose this game. They need yeah. to do something to, to shake up the overall ebb and flow. Uh, Boeing are definitely develop have de definitely developed a, a head of steam. So catching them off guard with a numbers advantage is, is going to be the key difference, in my opinion. Right now, it's one shrine apiece. America's gonna rotate in after catching the soap, leaving Johanna there for the moment. And right now, the position from Boeing, they understand the numbers. They're not putting themselves out there to get yanked. Bot controls here for Cerner, so they're not too concerned about the top side of the map. But meanwhile, Boeing positioning in the mid lane here, clearing out the wave. Eck is constantly doing this, forcing members of Cerner um, into different lanes to make sure that they pick up this soak. And it's a good job, but she just has to make sure that she's careful of not giving over too much control. And that's exactly what happened right now. Mayok starting the channel, and that's going to be the first Dragonite of the game completely for free. Yoink! I thought we might see Yorel jump over the wall to try to contest that especially once cold m kind of left the the shrine area i thought at the very least we would see ek go up and throw a flashlight out yep. to, to get the interrupt there but just the uh, flat-footed positioning and decision making is going to allow cerner to steal away first dragon in the game right out from under the noses of both mid wall down nice little dodge there of that corruption of course if it hits the dragon knight it gives you stacks because that is a heroic source Nice job to dodge that one, and it looks like it's just going to be the bot lane focus here for Cerner. Meanwhile, again, Johanna represented in the mid lane, maybe looking to make a flank on the members of Cerner in the bottom side, but so far, that's been a fantastic opener from Cerner. In the grand scheme, getting a Dragonite that early isn't going to be the end of the world. It doesn't net too much value. It got them, you know, the wall mid and one of the towers down here. And the experience, even after that, is still pretty much the same. But from a psychological perspective, it just says to Boeing, like, like we can't rest on our laurels here. Like, they will try to be aggressive here and make these decisions and, and come away with these Dragon Knights before we're ready. And potentially, that could bait them in a, into a situation where they're like, we got to be aggressive. We got to position ourselves and make a play. And then they overextend, and then Cerner capitalizes on that. So I think they need to be aware, but not over eager to try to respond to, to stuff like that. Cerner sending up Cold Am there on the Dahaka to pick up that wave, not willing to miss the experience. And I think that's great because throughout the course of this series, we've seen Cerner just try to be aggressive somewhere on the map and then miss a full wave and not really get a lot of value out of it. So I'm really, really glad that they kind of stopped doing that, made sure that only one minion was missed in this rotation. Really nice job because cleaning up those sort of things is basically what allows you to operate as better as a team, especially on this patch, considering how valuable minions are. Um, in basically the global scheme of, of the current, I guess, patch. Mm -hmm. Both of these teams have done a great job over the course of this series. If you're here to represent Boeing, let's see you say fly high Boeing in the chat. If you're here for Cerner, let's see you say let's go Cerner. Both of these teams definitely deserve our support and encouragement. They've given us a great series to watch so far. Next set of shrines will show up in about 15 seconds. Siege camp picked up for both sides. Ek doing a great job just doing some scouting, making sure that the rotation is not going to be able to jump on the back line. Gotta watch out for this Malganis. Both of these teams playing pretty solidly so far. The top lane skirmish is always fun to watch. Uh, both of these top laners just trying to position in the spell armor to kind of gain value there. Archie made the rotation up. Coldham has to be careful of not stepping onto that point because <laughs> Nara can just tear you to pieces and call them a nice job there to stop that from happening. Meanwhile, bottom side, Cerner have an opportunity to make a play. And they find it. Ek taking a lot of damage Ooh. here. Looks like that might be first blood, but the white main healing is so huge. You hear that chuckling? My area's like, you thought you were getting Ek, but actually not so much. Provac steps forward, gets some damage in. There's the condemn Ooh. just barely misses that connected column. I think that might have been first blood. For the moment, both shrines picked up by Cerner, but that is going to get changed over real quick. Even game so far, both of these teams now rounding the bend and hitting their heroics. Here we go. Shadow stock available. It's going to be the carry and swarm this time. And the sneaky pickup of the Dragonite because of the level 10 control is huge. Fear separating the members. That's so unfortunate. Almost on the backside of that one. Carry and swarm does come out, but there's no real pressure from Cerner. And Boeing are just going to be able to walk away for free. Not only were Bo was Boeing able to come away with the second Dragonite, and again, a cheeky manner done used and employed to get that but they were actually able to hold up Cerner for quite a while 
to allow the Dragonite to go through that middle of Fort Wall for free. You're going to rotate down with the Lunara and the Dragonite, backed up by Mary, and this is me. This could be a nice opportunity to get some corruption stacks. There's the kick. It's going to go ahead and send Krovax not too far back. You got to be impressed with the, the ability to answer back by stealing this Dragonite. X sitting in the mid lane though is a bit of a problem. It means that Boeing can't actually do anything with their Dragon Knight. It forces the members of Boeing back too far because that's a 4v3 with the potential of a 5v3 because of the Dahaka. I actually really don't like that rotation in the mid lane from uh, Johanna. It just relieves so much pressure. And off that Dragon Knight, just the mid and uh, a little bit of the bottom wall is basically the same as the first Dragon Knight of the game, but you know, it's later scaling, so it usually does a little bit more. I think that was a bit of a problem for Boeing. I, I would have to agree. Um, another thing that hasn't been so much of a problem for Boeing so far is this Dahaka from Colden. We were talking about this at the beginning. Can value be had off of the global pressure? Can we get a bro that shows up, yank someone out of position, gets that kill to really blow this game wide open for the team in red? And that really just hasn't happened yet. Um, will it happen later on once the death timers start to get longer? Very well possible. But right now, that's just not something that they've had to worry about yet. And that has to be good right now. You're on the side of Bill. Spam this pig to see Dahaka dig. We're going to see it. I know it's going to come through soon. I believe in the Dahaka brush stock. And once the map opens up, Lori, the brush stock becomes more and more of a probability. It's so much more space to operate. We'll see if it happens, but I, we need to see because if you don't see the brush stalker come in to force a numbers advantage, then what's the point in playing the global, right? Spam this pig to see. I don't even have a pig Sage words. Just... Sage words. <laughs> Sage words. Yeah, Wait, maybe. Leon Black has one, doesn't he? Maybe. I think he does. Well, there you go. Either way. I just want to see an oink or something at this point. You got me. Yeah. Next set of shrines is going to show up in about 25 seconds. You will be able to uh, come away with the next Dragon Knight in a stolen fashion. We'll see. Exact claims the Bruiser Camp. Uh, not so much prioritization on the Bruiser Camp that much on the side of Cerner in the grander scheme of things so that will definitely aid your rel you see dahaka rotating towards mid the old-fashioned way there isn't a fight really brewing out but hopefully that pig gets spammed kyle hopefully we see some dig action boeing set up quite a bit better for this phase because they do have this uh camp pushing in it gives exact time to just control top meanwhile cerner do have control over mid but they're losing pressure in the mid lane they're losing all of that minion so and when you have the global like that's not what you want but nice engage onto this is me golden's in trouble huge fear and cleanses to come through my rayry is just playing on fire scarlet age is saving the day this is me is going to be able to get back Ek may not be so fortunate though that is going to be johanna getting taken down first blood going over towards Cerner. Bottom Shrine going to be firmly in the hands of Cerner at the moment, but up top, we see Yorel getting value off of that takedown, pushing in this Bruiser Camp. Dahaka will wait up top to deal with this, but the damage is done. They do have the well available to them, though. That is going to get saved. That's a big right now in the overall grand scheme. There's no cleanse here for this. Uh -oh. He stepped up way too far, and Gul'dan goes down. That's too dead for Boeing. Can Cerner try to find their next Dragon Knight here? Meanwhile, Kolam is on top to start that channel. Rotation coming through from Mayog. Just going to stop Exact from stepping in. One of these members should be able to channel this one. Can Exact stop? Nope. Going to back off. That's it. I mean, these Dragon Knights have been stolen with everyone alive on the map and in each other's faces. So if you're down a hero, it's going to be that much more easy to pick up the objective and see what kind of damage you can do by wailing away with this Dragon Knight. Colam's going to rotate down, but the Dragon Knight is eating a solid amount of damage. They will be able to come away with this middle fort. They'll have 60% of the health to their name. Sleep goes out from Exec. Krovax jumping on the back line, seeing what kind of damage and kind of a menace they can be. Aves the way for the Dragonite to rotate down towards the bottom portion of the map. Cerner's really trying to get value out of this objective. 500 more damage, too, to finish that uh, ice block for Jaina as well. So that's a nice little power spike. 16 is very, very soon here for Cerner. They're stepping up very aggressively with this Dragonite. They have all heroics available on both sides. Do Cerner just rip? their heroics underneath this fort but it doesn't look like they're willing to do that and i think that is wise considering the fact that it's you know it's pretty scary to dive under pretty even circumstances underneath a fort like that that was an increasingly monka kind of situation kyle because there was a window where 16 was picked up by cerner yeah. and boeing wasn't able to say the same thing so if cerner did play it aggressively 
They start to throw some of their weight around. That could have been another takedown, maybe two. Bottom four and a further snowball advantage. But Cerner, cooler heads prevail. They back away after doing what they were looking for. They can go through that bottom four at their leisure at this point. But level 16 is now picked up for both teams. Breaststalker not available for another 35 seconds. So no big plays to be made with that global quite yet. Serener have this advantage where they can start up their bruiser camp, which we're already seeing them do here. And that's going to be pushing in the top lane. Serener's going to have a lot of pressure up there and they're going to be able to make a play with this brush stalker very, very shortly here. 15 seconds left on cooldown. Boeing need to be careful of starting this camp. I like the heads up decision. They look on the mini map. They don't see everyone. They're like, we could get it invaded on. We have more oh, to lose than the game here. But now they're actually rotating around. You're not There's locked in here. Bottom. <laughs> uh oh. This is about to be a pretty interesting progression if our keys get pressed. Oh, there's oh. one, but that was a complete whiff. Unfortunate. Brush Stalker was up too, so that could have been a pretty big fight breaking out over this bottom side camp, but instead it was just a Warden's Cage Prepare spent. Yourself, but that's heroes. that's huge. That's a hundred second cooldown. And you know Boeing saw that, so they're going to be further emboldened by that. They don't have to worry about the displacement and zoning effort. Uh, Deerstalker or Brushstalker is going to still be available. Do they see Cold and Burrow down? Exact. I think I haven't been keeping an eye on this the entirety of the game, but I would like to think that Cold Am has been trying to burrow, but Jarrell's just been there for the knockback to kind of dissuade that. Because otherwise, Cold Am's leaving a lot of value on the table here by not burrowing it. Gonna be able to sit on this top point and start to control here for Cerner. Meanwhile, mid is under control as well. We don't want to see a fast cap, and Mayog is already starting it up, oh, and that is just another just sneaky zoinks. DK going over to Cerner. They, you can't allow that to happen time and time again. I think every Dragonite outside of the one where Goldman was then, where it's just been, we just steal this away for free. The rotation is late. No one's really trying to mine at least in one of the shrines. And sooner or later, one of these teams are going to lose out the hard way. And it very well might be Boeing right now as they lose their middle keep wall. They are doing a very serviceable job of burning down a Dragonite. Not to mention some of the health bars here on the yeah. side of Cerner. But you just can't keep giving up the objective for free like this. So Cerner have a really, really good position in this game now because of this bottom port being down. But Krovac's taking so much damage, forced to actually use the Carrion Swarm to get out of that scenario immediately mounting up and running to safety but Cerner have the global now against no fort on their opponents so if Boeing ever step up to contest this bottom shrine Dahaka is going to be able to dig where this wisp is currently and make big flanking plays so we'll see if Cerner can find those sort of uh, win conditions later on Boeing you know with this gold Dan and having those angles opened up are in quite a bit of trouble if you think about it from a team fighting perspective i gotta agree the further opened up this map the further harrowing harrowing it's going to be for boeing to venture to the other side of the battleground and try to make any kind of magic happen when it's 19.5 though only rounding the bend towards 19 also cerner are in a very good position to get a sizable advantage once level 20 comes around to get a takedown at 15, 16 minutes into the game, you're gonna start to feel some of these death timers. With the middle fort or the middle keep wall already knocked on that hard, all it takes is a takedown for you to have to deal with catapults for the rest of the game. 20s are so very close here for Cerner. And again, we've got to constantly talk about the fact that the map is open. Boeing are in a lot of trouble because of that. They need to stay as a tight knit four. They need to control these, um, their side bushes like they're doing there with the Wisp. That's a fantastic job. Maybe even a little bit Ooh. deeper. Look at this flank from Cerner. And then there's Rush the Wisp. There's the Burrow. They're coming in hard, but the nice blessed shield. Is it going to save the health bars? There's a the perfectly timed cleanse from White Mane. Egg starting to back away. Turns around, hits the Condemn, brings Krovax back in the tower range forces out the carrion swarm nice attempt not able to come away with too much f out of it what a legend Eck just sending the blessed shield into that bush because of that wisp as well from archie so Descended. so fantastic to just rip the blessed shield it's a 60 second cooldown you saved your entire team because of it the intercession cleanse from white main as well just to allow johanna to get to safety but that's the sort of heads up reaction time that you need as a front line to save your team really nice job by Eck. she has been making plays Sometimes you just got to send it, right, Colin? Yes, buddy, for sure. <laughs> Sometimes you're out there for a rip. You just got to send it. Exactly. I mean, with Eight clouds. Hey, hey, I know, eh? I mean, with only a minute <laughs> cooldown, I'd rather spend the minute cooldown on my heroic than my teammates. 
So exactly. you definitely got to do you got to do things like that as the front line. Um, next set of shrines are going to be available. We'll be seeing another instance where Dragonite just gets picked up right right in front of somebody's face. We will see. Tahaka will still be able to burrow. Went back up towards the top part of the lane. Exact oh has just been living life in this top lane. Like they really hadn't been able to go much of anywhere. If they show up, if they are able to rotate in, this could get interesting. Same equation exists here. Cold, I'm just waiting for the members of Boeing to show on the map so that uh, you can step onto this top point. Cerner have Ooh. so much control over this map. This is really, really good for them. Boeing are having a difficult time dealing with all of the macro control that Cerner are bringing to the table. The global is, while it hasn't proven super powerful in the team fights, it is creating so much pressure on this map, no matter what. I was a little concerned there. Ek almost rotating in from the siege camp area, but look at that fear going out. Uh oh, Malganis is gonna have to sit the rest of this team fight out. Tulio's like, I left my stove on. Gonna go ahead and exit stage right. Sin is already mounted up for the retreat. Yorel, gonna go ahead and try to fight this Coldam off. Coldam, I think they have essence. Not able to see that right now. I'd imagine that they would, but with Mayog rotating up, this could be a pretty rough 2v1. Instant mount from Exact helps them get out. Other members of Boeing were on rotation right now. Cerner, despite being uh -oh. down one member, the global power is there. Mayog in a bit of trouble here. Are there any tools available? She had no way of escaping <gasps> this one aside from using the E, and that was an excellent job. There's no other lockdown from Boeing there to kind of secure that kill. Fear was on cooldown. Another 10 seconds left on that Blessed Shield as well. So nice job by my F to escape. Keep Certain your Nikes team. laced, because these jukes are going to be real for Mayok. The Condemned just outside of Rage to pull Mayak back in. Corruption just barely missing. I'm netting full value. This is me, Nairi, Ek, holding down the fort. Up in the top portion of the map, Coldam and Exec. Urel should be able to hold on this for a more than long enough of time. With Johanna to come away with the next Dragonite of this game. And now Boeing able to open up this map off of that single kill, picking up forts now. Starting to control more of this map because they really haven't had any control this entire game. So this is really, really fantastic for Boeing at this point. But Cerner have an opportunity to just look for a fast engage. They can dig onto the backside of this fight. This is a Gul'dan, remember. He's very, very immobile. So we'll see if Cerner decide to just kind of rip a fight here. Nice burrow there. Saves Coldan for the moment, but has it left him out on an island? Krovax jumps on the back line. Has to use the Crayon Swarm to get back towards a safe space. Johanna, the Dragonite, absolutely gets shredded down. I, I had hoped we'd see more conservative positioning and try to preserve the health bar of that Dragonite because I do think that Boeing is at a place where they kind of needed to get this, this keep in the mid lane or at least put sizable enough damage on it yeah. to where they could rotate to get that if they get a takedown later on because... They haven't been able to venture to this side of the map super often. Five for two heroics used as well, so Cerner not really wanting to step up and fight for that siege camp, especially considering how they have their Dahaka already up top here. They don't really want to take any unreasonable risks. Cerner again with their global bruiser camp up in 20 seconds. Perhaps they try to make another setup play where they have pressure in the top lane and they look to engage on the bottom side when Yorel shows mid top. We'll see if Cerner try to do that, but so far this has been. So how could we even ask for a better game five? I, I'm 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 impressed. I'm excited to see how this plays out. Late game Dragonshire can sometimes be some of the most intense heroes of the storm action possible. How do you rotate? Where do you allocate your resources? When do you go for a camp? Can you catch someone out of position? When you're dealing with something like a Tahaka, everything can shift on the drop of a dime. The moment you hear that burrow, it's Monka S in the chat. So far again. The Dahaka just hasn't really been that terrifying threat. If anything, it's kind of kept exact on Yorel in the top lane. Just continuing to try to, like, mine those fences. But Here it really go. just hasn't been that terrifying to do. This could be the setup that uh, Cerner were looking for, but and Boeing recognize it, so they rotate down the Yorel, and I don't think Cerner know that Yorel's here just yet. So we'll see if that Brush Stalker comes through. If the Brush Stalker doesn't come through and they just oh. trade this camp out, I think that Cerner have an opportunity to set up the map really, really well. Blessed Shield goes out and no real value from it. There's the Horrify well. also. That a little bit discombobulated on their her use of heroics. That could allow Cerner to come away with the upper hand in his fight, but look at the damage going out on Cold Am. There's the end of Destructible, but uh, Ek is eating so much damage. White Man or not, hangs on. Gold Man is actually going to get first, get taken down. And then there's the other part of the front line eating damage. Mayak steps forward, yanks him back. Three That's heroes, it. make that four. And it leaves just Yorel 
I think this could be game, Kyle. Members of Cerner are stepping in. They're trying to figure out exactly what play they need to make to finish this game. And to me, that's just a simple DK and run it down a lane. You got 40 second death timers there on the Goldan. You've got top not being capped quite yet, but it's going to come through real soon. And Cerner, I'm really glad that they just forced the fight like that. The members of Boeing were stepped up so far. The Bless Shield came under a fort. The fear happened and nobody was able to follow up. That was two major heroics, especially considering how it was Haunt picked up at level 20. That's the armor reduction on fear. So if you can't follow up and find kills off of the fears, then that's almost an entirely useless level 10 and 20. So huge plays by Cerner to force back in that fight and find victory. The death timers are pretty low, but this is a late game DK. This should very easily be game four, Cerner. It would take a Herculean effort for Boeing to be able to hang on in this game. Look how much damage is coming out. There is no way. We're going to see Cerner take game number five. When you have two teams this evenly matched, it comes down to one moment. You, you throw out the blessed shield. You don't get value off of the horrify. Any lack of coordination is going to be curtains. We saw Cerner fully capitalize on that. Take one decisive team fight. Grab the Dragon Knight. Run it down mid figuratively and literally be our grand finals champion. They ran it down in game and ran it down in our hearts. Ladies and gentlemen, Cerner <laughs> turned it around. They did not look like, in my opinion, off of game number one, a lot of the times you can watch a team, um, you can watch a game number one and realize which team is probably going to win. And after watching game number one, that was a huge win by Boeing. Mm -hmm. uh, not only was it a huge draft victory, but a huge just macro victory. They were seconds ahead of their opponents in every single move. And then Cerner just came back. They played the resilient game. They drafted better. They played smarter. And that was a very, very well-deserved game number five. Fantastic job by Cerner. Honestly, both of these teams deserve a round of applause. That was such good play from both of these teams. Yeah, I mean, I feel like this is a match that could have gone either way. Uh, it, it literally came down to one final team fight. Um, the Bless Shield went out. It looked like the rest of the team was starting to back away. Like that was the call as the Horrify went out. So it was yeah. just unfortunate timing there. Uh, and when you don't have to deal with those two forms of lockdown and or displacement, that's going to be the green light uh, for yeah. Cern to go in. They were able to force the fight. Um, and it almost actually went Boeing's way. There's a lot yeah. of damage coming out. And I was like, is White Man going to White Man their way out of this, out of this team fight? But uh, there was just too much damage on the gold end. That was the first hero to get blown up. The indestructible, that only lasted for what? A second and a half tops? There was yeah. just and so much damage. The indestructible came out, what, off of Mayev's first Q in that fight? <laughs> so you know that the pace of the fight was so well in favor of Cerner at that point so yeah really nice job by them to realize that and capitalize on it and just turn that fight it was a big last team fight that's for sure great play from both sides um how would you feel about potentially trying to get mayag in 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 the voice because i want to ask him i want to ask him what they were how they were going like what the voice comms were like in that last team play if it's possible bring it in me. Let's see if we get Mayog in here. It's always fun hearing their um, their thoughts on basically yeah. everything involving the the series. And yeah, again, thanks to every single person who tuned in today. It was really really fun casting these games. Like, it, it's always such a pleasure getting to cast with you as well. And thank you for the invitation, AHGL, uh, choosing us two to to cast these games. What an honor, Blake, Mayog, congratulations, man. That was a great game five finish. How are you feeling after that one? Well, my uh, my heart's beating fast, but uh, <laughs> yeah, really, really happy. Good. I'm. I'm. Th thanks for having the the flexibility to to jump in here. With this. Like this is all off the cuff. Um, but we were just really impressed with your your team's play. Uh, both teams play over the course of the series. But one of the things I I wanted to ask you, uh, Kyle and I noticed over that last team fight in the bot lane, um, the blessed shield goes out. And it looks like the rest of Boeing starting to back away. And then the Horrify goes out. At that moment, um, were the voice comms like super hype? Like, we, we have this opportunity to go in. Uh, what, what was going on in comms at that moment? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we saw the, the Horrify come out kind of under our fort where they couldn't follow up on it. And we still had, I think we still had all of our ults at this point. We just, we finally got the, uh, the cage we were looking for pretty much the whole series. And we were able to do what we... What we wanted to do. Cool. cool. My, my question for you guys is 
off of game number one, I was talking about the pace of series and looking at the matchup in game number one, like you guys, um, I think got out drafted and out rotated for a lot of that game. Um, how did you guys bounce back from that one mentally? Uh, did you uh, kind of accept that Boeing maybe came out with a better draft or like, what were your thoughts on game one moving into game number two? Cause it looked like a different team moving into game number two. You guys stepped up faster. You were the ones who commanded rotation. Like you guys just looked like a different team. Yeah, we, uh, we definitely didn't bother us. Um, didn't let it bother us that much. We knew, uh, BOE is, uh, Boeing's one of their, one of their best maps. They play it pretty much every game of the series that they have it up. I'm pretty sure. And we were just, we were kind of expecting to lose that one. Um, we just didn't let it get to us in our, in our last game of the playoffs. We lost, we ended up losing the first one as well, and then came back for a sweep. So we were just, well, here we go again. Um, we, we felt like we were playing good. Um, our, we had kind of at the first immortal, um, our solo laner lagged and kind of got picked and we were like, well, that's, that's going to really hurt. And, yeah. uh, we were playing from behind after that, pretty much the whole game. I think they got almost two immortals and it was just pretty difficult. We made a lot of just micro mistakes as well in a lot of the fights, but, uh, we knew we could play better than that. And we just, uh, we're like, all right, let's bring it together and show them what we can do the rest of the series. Awesome. Thanks. You definitely showed us what you guys are capable of, you know, as competitors, it has has to feel great to uh you know take this series the game five to rally back to to have that decisive team fight um but you you know you're not just playing for the the competitive spirit you're also bringing home forty five hundred dollars in in prizing for charity um how, how does that feel to be able to, to to bring that uh to a charity organization you know based off your efforts here it it feels really good uh cerner is uh, a healthcare. Uh, organization. So we see, well, let me back up a step. So firsthand is Cerner's um, charity. Um, and I'm a big fan of it because pretty much everybody at Cerner works in the healthcare in some form or fashion. And in my opinion, the um, our healthcare system in the U.S. just kind of fails a lot of children, especially. So uh, we have, you know, organizations like firsthand are able to get in there and give the kids the care that they, that they aren't going to be getting, you know, in the U.S. or otherwise. And uh, just being able to contribute to that, something that I see day in, day out in my job, is just feels really good. I got I, I, that, That's great, man. I, I, I think you guys have a lot to feel proud of, not only in terms of your, your play here, but just the fact that you are going to be able to uh, enrich the lives of children who are going to be able to benefit that. Um, great job to you guys for that. Uh, After Hours Gaming League is, is a really cool effort um to to allow companies like yours to to come together and and play for charity um this has been an interesting week for heroes of the storm in terms of competitive <laughs> play <clears throat> uh so it's also really cool for you to show some of the promise and potential uh that is heroes of the storm at a competitive level um how, how are you feeling about bringing that part of the the angle to the equation like this, this is a very fun best of five. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure you want to see stuff like this going forward into the future. Yeah, for sure. I know um, a lot of us, we participate in a lot of the amateur leagues like Heroes Lounge and previously the Open Division. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's a shame to see that going. And, you know, most of us, you know, wish that, you know, I, I know there's been some talks of like some, uh, some people putting together a pool and trying to get some amateur leagues going for some prize money and, um, we all really hope that uh, that happens. So, you know, I'm glad that we could get out there and have a good series. Hey, I definitely think you guys uh, uh, represent the the spirit and heart of competitive heroes. Um, good folks coming together to play good games for a good cause. I mean, what what better what better <laughs> representation is there? Uh, any any shout outs you you want to give to to anyone before before we let you go and enjoy your your win? Yeah, I especially want to shout out uh, After Hours Gaming um, just for, for putting this on. Um, there was a lot of my teammates who were going to play in the League of Legends season a couple years ago, and After Hours Gaming um, had to shut down for a couple years. I don't know really the specific of specifics of it, but it's nice to see them getting back in there. And uh, it seems that this year, both the fall and the spring season, were pretty successful. Um, so I'm happy to, to see them, and I hope that uh, next year the uh, 
the games, you know, whatever games they may be, I hope we get more viewership and, and raise more money for charity. Cool, man. Uh, I, I guess that's going to do it. We have our fall 2018 Grand Finals champions. Comes down to an epic Game 5 finale. Cerner, you guys have a lot to feel good about. Congratulations, and uh, thanks for putting on such exciting games. All right, Congrats. guys. Thanks a lot for casting. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Kyle, this has been a blast. I always I always love getting the cast with you, but I'm really thankful for After Hours Gaming uh, for reaching out to us, giving us this opportunity to... Uh, to, to help showcase some some really cool games um any any shout outs you want to give it's always a pleasure man yeah thank you ahgl for the opportunity and of course you as a co-caster it's just way too much fun